Um, I now declare the meeting open to the public online. Can I welcome members who are participating by telephone conferencing this morning, or Leah Flynn, Alex, <coughs> Alex and Pat. Can I remind members about the protocols regarding the use of electronic devices? So we have no apologies today, we have a full attendance. Um, in terms of chairperson's business, we have created this, we've, we've focused this session on um, addictions in light of the fact that this is Mental Health Week, and also in light of the fact that we are aware that there are huge difficulties and issues around both addiction and mental health at this particular time in light of the COVID pandemic. Um, and the responses to those all are of concern to the committee and the support for people. And I think on behalf of the committee this morning, I would just like to extend our best wishes to everyone out there who is struggling with issues of addiction or with issues of poor mental health. We do understand that this is a, a hugely difficult time, and I suppose we would, we would just repeat the message that it's, it's okay to not be okay and to reach out. There are services still operating, and if you're in need of support or help, please reach out to someone and speak to someone, um, and, and please know that we are aware that this is an issue that many people are struggling with at this time and, and potentially in the future. So thank you for that. Uh, moving then to the minutes, I refer items to the draft minutes of the meeting held on the 14th of May, which are in your pack there at tab 3.1. Are members content with the minutes? Mm. Content, thank you. Matters arising, can I advise members that there are no matters arising from the minutes? So we we'll now move into our first substantive session this morning in terms of our work on COVID-19 disease response. And we have asked for a briefing this morning from a number of organisations in relation to addiction services during the COVID-19 pandemic. I refer members to correspondence at tab 5.1 of the pack and a briefing note at 5.2 of your table papers. Can I advise members that representatives from several organisations from the NI Alcohol and Drug Alliance are here today to brief the committee on the challenges facing those drug and with, with drug and alcohol dependencies during the COVID-19 pandemic. So I'd like to welcome this morning Mrs. Anne-Marie McClure, Chief Executive Officer of START 360 and Chair of NIADA. Are you there okay, Anne-Marie? I am today, Colin. Thank you. Mr. Owen Ryan, Head of Harm Reduction Services with the Simon Community. Are you there, Owen? I am, yes. Thank you, Owen. Uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Alex Bunting, Director of Addiction NI. Alex, are you there? I'm here, yep. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Mr. Mal Byrne, Assistant Director of Addictions and Mental Health Extern. Mal, are you on there? I'm on, thank you. Yep. Thank you. And Mr. Ian Cameron, Harm Reduction Manager with Extern. We have you on the line, Ian. Yes, I'm here. So, thank you for that, members. And I would now like to invite you to present, and I think we're going first to Mrs. Anne-Marie McClure. Anne-Marie, would you like to go ahead and brief the committee, please? And we'll go to other members then in turn. And if you could just say who is speaking uh, before your presentation. Thank you. Yes, indeed. This is Anne-Marie McClure. Um, thank you uh, for the invite. Um, we are, we, we, we are, are very pleased to be offered this opportunity. And uh, thank you, Colin, for reminding us that this is Mental Health Week. And, and, and we appreciate that. Uh, you know, mental health is a challenge in Northern Ireland anyway, but it's even more of a challenge as we move through these very different times. Um, I am a Chief Executive Start360 who deliver uh, services, uh, drug and alcohol services and mental health and employability services across uh, Northern Ireland to young people um, and offenders. Uh, both in uh, the community and within the prison setting. I am chairperson of NIADA. Um, you, you, the members there of the committee will have uh, my briefing paper in front of them, and uh, it does list our, our, our membership there. Our members in the main of all uh, hold contracts uh, and deliver uh, contracts for the PHA and or uh, individual trusts or all five trusts. Uh, to deliver uh, addiction services uh, ac across Northern Ireland. Uh, NIADA um, uh, is funded uh, since 
2019 uh, by the PHA to allow us to employ a part-time support officer. NIADA, however, is moving forward. All of our members, uh, dependent on their income, um, do, uh, uh, we do ask for membership fees, and that is uh, 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 as part of the transition into full independence because NIADA wants to be the independent voice of the sector, not only the providers of alcohol and drug services, but also uh, for service users who obviously are very key uh, in all that we do. Um, the brief that, um, that is in front of you highlights members' concerns across all services uh, and, and, and concerns of service users because we did consult with them. It also highlights that, the, that NIADA is uh, currently undertaking two pieces of research. We have a piece of research which will be uh, uh, produced in draft form on the 15th of June about a drug uh, and alcohol polydrug use in the workplace. Uh, and uh, it, it has some rich data. Uh, and again, it has kind of highlighted some of the concerns that we had there, that this is a substantial problem. The other research which has just started last week uh, is a piece of research which is documenting the change of behaviours and trends among um, NIADA um, uh, providers uh, and service users as a result of the pandemic. Uh, and hopefully uh, we, we will be able to uh, also look at the models of intervention and what has worked best for for those um, individuals uh, during this, uh, uh, this challenging time. But just to focus on one thing, we had our last meeting on the 29th of April, uh, and it raised, we raised these issues. Uh, but one of the issues that was specifically a concern was in relation to OST uh, opio opioid sub uh, sub substitution therapy and the services across the five trusts. And the lack of clarity and information that we had about this essential service, particularly for new inductions, and we felt there was a bit of a, of a postcode lottery. So we, we wrote to the minister and um, the CMO in relation to our concerns, uh, protect, in particular to those new, uh, to those that required or on the waiting list for induction or uh, who, who required induction uh, uh, potentially those that had been released either early from prison or uh, uh, as part of their natural uh, release into the community. We received, I have to say, um, members of the committee, we did receive a very comprehensive response uh, which did clarify the current OST um, support available. Uh, but uh, our primary concern of those outside of the service were, were not uh, full, fully addressed. Uh, I'm talking again about these new uh, inductions. So uh, basically, we're, 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 very, um, we're very keen uh, that the postcode lottery that do does exist, um, particularly in this service, does not continue and that there is a joined up approach required that all trusts are delivering services to, and it is a small number, it's not large numbers, but significant high risk clients because we in NIADA believe that lack of access to these services has a range of knock-on effects, which we have listed or among those that are listed in our briefing paper. So at, at this point, um, I would like to hand over to my colleague and um, NIADA member, uh, Owen. Thank you. And just, just before you go to Owen, can I check with the members that, that everyone has their phone on mute? There's a wee bit of feedback coming through the system there. Just if everyone can check that your, your phone is on mute, and if not, place it on mute, if possible, please. So uh, go on now then, Owen, go ahead, please. Uh, how you doing? Uh, listen, I just to echo what uh, Anne-Marie said. Thank you for the opportunity to uh, uh, present um, to the committee. So uh, I work for the Simon community, and I manage the drug and alcohol services within the organisation. So I'm going to just maybe give an overview of, of what we've been experiencing um, in our services over the period of, of, of the lockdown. And I think initially that, that, that period was um, 
relatively stable in terms of drug al- alcohol use. You know, there was a, a fairly, um, there was quite a significant reduction in our overdoses, which I suppose we, we were initially quite surprised about. That has changed within the past few weeks, particularly the past three weeks, where we have seen a significant increase in overdoses, particularly in relation to um, street bought diazepam or street blues, as they're uh, colloquially known. Um, we're seeing the hostels flooded with these pills at the moment. Um, we have had the opportunity to send a number of these away for um, analysis, and they've come back with varying um, substances, um, but none of them with diazepam in them. Uh, we had pills that were tested in the Newry area that came back with morphine, and pills um, from the Belfast area that came back with flu out. Um, Fluoroprazolam, um, which is a novel benzodiazepine, um, more similar to, to Xanax. Um, so we're quite concerned about the, the potency of these pills and the fact that um, our service users are taking them in, in fairly considerable and large amounts. We're seeing quite a lot of overdose, a lot of um, behaviours like aggression and low mood. Um, and there's a significant increase in incidents related to um, kind of aggression, and as a result, sometimes we're, we're forced into um, having to, to close beds when people have been arrested as a result of this. So there's quite a knock-on impact of the availability and the fact that we're, you know, as I say, the hostels certainly have been flooded with these pills. I suppose one one of the things that you know we maybe take the opportunity to, as, as an ask would be that. Um, if we were able to have these pills analysed locally and that information about the content of them shared, it would be a significant uh, have a significant impact for us to get that information out to our service users around what the risk is, what is actually in these pills, and um, some harm reduction advice. We're sending them away to, to Wales to a place of Wednesday to have them. Um, Analyze. So it's, it's a slow enough process, so that information coming back is slow. So it seems like a, quite a significant gap locally that this isn't available to us. Um, we're, we're also seeing quite a significant deterioration in uh, a lot of service users' mental health. Um, you know, the, the staff in our hostels are having to, I suppose, step up in relation to, the, to, to what they're, they're um, providing support-wise. With the absence of a lot of the other services that we would have relied on, and you know, who are now providing remote or telephone support, which works for some, but maybe for a more chaotic service users, it's not. It isn't working, and there's no respite for these for, for a lot of these uh, individuals where they have, and um, they may have taken days off, and um, site to go and stay with family or friends. Those avenues are now closed, so they're spending considerable periods of times in the hostels. Um, in the rooms, our communal areas are obviously difficult, you know, in terms of so, social distancing. So, the deterioration in mental health is having an impact in terms of substance use as well. We're seeing an increase in drinking and just polydrug use in in, in general. Um, so, and the knock-on impact in terms of of overdose. Um, you know, and to echo some of what uh, Anne Marie said around the OST, the, the opiate substitution therapy, we, you know, we would have worked with quite a number of individuals in terms of getting them to the point where they're ready to, to be inducted onto the OST, and they, you know, th- th- there's no uh, time frames in terms of when the service may be um, reintroduced. So trying to keep that in, you know, to the motivation to, uh, for them to, to remain kind of at a stage where they were starting to stabilize has gone. A lot of them have returned to that high risk drug use. And again, sometimes with the impact of that on loss of beds because of behaviors or because of what, what they've had to do to get money in terms of being arrested. So, you know, again, just to, to reiterate, reiterate the fact that, you know, we're in the dark, we, we, we're not sure of the time frames. And we can't then pass it on to our service users who, again, you know, are, are finding it difficult to maintain or sustain any t- type of, um, you know, stability. And um, we're, we're dealing with that at the hard edge. 
Um, so we would be calling for us was better communication with the substitute prescribing teams and community addiction services. You know, proper partnership work in here would, would help in terms of just that communication and decisions being, I uh, suppose, transparent as well around you know what 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 the roadmap looks like for reintroduction, what is happening in the different regions, you know, the different trust areas, um, because obviously we're right across the north in the you know, Simon Community Hostel, so we're seeing that firsthand. Um, you know, the, the fact that different services are operating differently dependent on, on, on where they are. Um, so look, I, I know that we're limited to time, so I'll, I'll, I'll finish off on that point. And uh, thanks again for this opportunity. Okay. Thank you, Owen. And then I'll go back to the panel. Um, so uh, is there another member of the panel who wishes to present now? Uh, Mal, are you, are you there, Mal? Yeah, I'm here, yeah. You want to Look, give thank you. That, yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, my name is Mal Byrne. I'm, I work for Exeter. Uh, so thanks very much for the opportunity to discuss what's been happening in terms of, of our services and, and wider than that. Extern currently provides about nine drug and alcohol services across, you know, three trusts, um, mainly working with those chronic and severe drug and alcohol users. Um, I suppose, just to echo what Owen and Amory have already said, you know, that there has been a lot of difficulties in terms of adapting our practice, but I think overall, you know, we've, we've done the best that we possibly can. So we had five specific services in Belfast, and they kept working throughout this whole period. Um, obviously, working face-to-face -face on the street is quite difficult. Some of our other services, um, they're all outreach-based services, so they would traditionally have gone into the home to work with individuals with chronic alcohol and drug issues. That hasn't been possible. And I suppose one of the new ways of working and the new normal that people talk about, I suppose, is a lot of phone contact and, and even meeting people in the garden. So that has its own challenges in terms of working with people who are chronically using substances. Um, some of the issues that we faced, and I, I think it's been echoed by the other speakers so far, is that there's been a rise, I suppose, in desperation amongst some of the service users. Um, we've, we've noted an increase of aggression, um, the deterioration of, of mental health, I mean, especially amongst uh, those individuals who would um, find themselves homeless or have been homeless in the past. Uh, there hasn't really been a reduction from what we can see in terms of the supply of drugs, illicit drugs, uh, but what has obviously happened is that access to money to purchase these drugs has become more difficult and that's led to a certain level of, of desperation among some service users. We have an extra and dealt with a number of overdoses on the street over this period and that continues to be an issue. Uh, I know a lot of providers and ourselves included have continued to give out naloxone on a regular basis and ensure that the hostels and other providers have access to that. With, to prevent the overdose um, if possible. There was seen a rise in poly drug use. And again, that's maybe due to the price of um, getting and getting funds to buy drugs. So there's been a switch to, to alcohol and benzodiazepines, as the ones already pointed out. Uh, and that's because the money maybe isn't available for people to buy heroin or other opiates. I suppose one of the big things I'd like to point out is that there has been some positives out of this work. I mean, we work very closely with the councils and police and, and the other providers and especially providers in the homeless sector. And I think there's been some excellent work done across the sector in terms of working with this client group. Uh, we also, as extern, we wrote to the CMO around um, access to substitution therapies. Um, we have put forward a plan around low-dose substitution for about 25 to 35 IV drug users who are in the Belfast city centre area who were expressing to the teams that they would be quite willing to move on to this. And I know that this has happened in other parts of the UK and, and Ireland. Um, but again, we got a response um, from Dr. McBride, but it basically directs us back to the trust. And at that stage, it really hasn't moved forward. We were proposing that we could use GP services to, to stabilise people and move them on to low dose, low doses of methadone, which would stabilise a lot of the issues and maybe help in terms of, of some of the other behaviours. Um, I know that a lot of people have been moved in by the housing sector to temporary accommodation, flats, etc. And there was a lot of issues around that breaking down. So we thought that if we followed maybe the model in Scotland and, and some other parts of the UK where people have access to rapid rapid induction, uh, stabilization, then maybe we could have um, worked on some of those issues and people would have, you know, prevented 
prevent drug use and overdose and some of the other behaviours. But unfortunately, that that isn't happening. So again, I suppose not to be too controversial, but Northern Ireland seems a wee bit behind in terms of our approach to to substitution. And I know that Belfast Trust have now last week come out and said that they're inducting two new people a week. Uh, and they're the first trust in Belfast, I think, is what they said, that they're going to be doing that. But again, two people, it's quite a long period of time before you would get through the cohort that uh, are currently using. Just for the future, I suppose, for, for people to, to maybe think about, um, the deterioration of mental health is obviously, everybody's aware of that, and it is Mental Health Week. Uh, I think we've seen that already during this period among some of our service users. Um, there's going to be difficulties in one-to-one engagement, especially with therapeutic work. Um, like all organisations, we're trying to think about creatively about how we can do that. I think, again, in the press today, there was uh, uh, information around their use of alcohol and how that's increased dramatically and could use, lead to long-term issues around that. Uh, and again, obviously, the cost of, of a lot of what's going on, there's going to be funding issues for services in the future. And again, our, our project, um, CISS, up in the foil area, which deal with people that are presenting with suicide ideas, and that's one out of funding in June. So that'll be an, a, a project that's probably going to close very soon. Uh, I suppose the irony of that on other projects that are working um, to prevent suicide is that we probably will face more and more of this, and drug use and, and alcohol use is a key factor in that. So, um, that's really all I've got to say on that. I'm aware of the time, but thank you very much for the opportunity. Thank you, Mal. And finally, then, I'm going to Alex, who I believe is, is uh, doing a presentation on behalf of Addictions NA. Alex, are you there? I am. Thanks very much. Yeah. I'd like to echo uh, my colleagues in saying um, thank you for the opportunity to come and present with you today. Um, I'm the director of Addiction NA. Um, as you know, we, we provide step two services for the public health agency and uh, the Belfast Trust in Belfast. Um, and in Belfast, there are significant waiting lists um, for services with ourselves around those step two services. Um, and we've seen that increase over the, the, the past few weeks. Um, we also operate the Substance Misuse, Misuse Court in partnership with the, the Court Service and the Probation Service. We have a significant older adult program in the Western Trust, which focuses on people impacted by alcohol over the age of 50 years old. Um, since the lockdown, Addiction NA uh, would move quickly to try and adjust their delivery model uh, to enable people to receive continued support. Um, our service schedules remain uh, at capacity, and we continue to have significant witness, as I said, for Belfast services. And that's down to a gap in the commissioning framework that happened um, about five years ago that was, was never filled. Um, what I would say is that alcohol is the primary drug causing issues for our client group, um, the people coming through our services, with prescribed medications also causing significant issues. In our more chaotic um, um, profile coming through the, the courts, I, I would like to echo um, some of the concerns and issues that Mal and Owen have raised in terms of access to OST um, and I think you know we do need to look at what is going on across the UK and try and mirror some of the best practice to try and bring us in line and up to date with um, how we're approaching that issue. Um, you know we, we have seen that 31 percent increase in, in, in alcohol sales through off sales um, has been reported in the media as well. Um, in, in terms of referrals uh, for people impacted by alcohol issues in particular or older adults um, out of the 200 people, 214 people in our Belfast services waiting, 84 of those are over the age of 50 and their primary drug use is alcohol. So we have seen since lockdown, again, um, older adults impacted by the use of alcohol, and that's probably representative of the increased sales in alcohol as people are trying to deal with the mental health issues, the anxiety and the isolation. We've also seen a significant increase in people accessing our social support services and helping us or getting us to help them um, access food banks and community support schemes. So we've had to increase our capacity of, of social support. We've also had to look at different ways of connecting people. Um, some of our user, drug users or uh, service users haven't had access to, for example, mobile phones or haven't had uh, money, so we've had to secure um, some support from local supermarkets, giving us mobile phones to keep people connected during lockdown. Um, 
the positives, uh, as Mal said, I mean, we've seen huge positives and huge um, learning experiences through this. Our telephone support engagement service was able to take over straight away, and we're, we've all been working remotely from home. We have moved all of our recovery uh, groups online, and they're working with great success. Um, and we've enhanced those social support services, again, which have helped people access the real things like food parcels and access to other social supports. And we've also developed the check-in service, which we're trying to prevent people from relapsing and keep people stable. So that would be our service users who, you know, maybe had completed a, a round of treatment, um, and we have just kept them engaged, making sure that they're okay during the lockdown. We've also developed an, an online support hub, which is um, being heavily used across workplaces, the sports CNI, and the veterans community, um, and, and we plan to launch that. Um, further uh, into other age groups and, and uh, services in the future. Okay, thank you, Alex. And that, that completes those presentations, so we'll, we'll go in now to a few questions and answers. I suppose from, well, before I start, I should declare an interest in that I have worked previously as a social worker um, and have worked actually with, with many of the organisations involved. I was in an older persons team, but um, there were significant issues around addictions and around comorbidities and, and issues that you have already identified. So I'll just declare that as, a, as an interest. Um, but also, in terms of my experience of how invaluable the services that many of you are providing had been to us as social workers, but unfortunately, there often wasn't capacity um, for, for very many of the cases that were out there. So I suppose the Department of Health has advised the committee that robust procedures have been put in place to ensure continuity of services via telephone and video and online systems. In particular, measures have been put in place to support those on, on substitute prescribing and naloxone and needle exchange services remain fully open and operational. And I have heard several of you mention there the opioid su substance, substitu substitution treatments um, as, as a particular if difficulty, although there has been some good work done there. But in general, have services, in your view, remained fully operational, and how effective has the trust and the PHA's response been to date? And that's over to the panel there, if, if one of you want to lead on that. Well, if I could take that, this, um, this is Anne-Marie McClure, um, Colin. Yeah, uh, yeah in, in terms of... Um, of the support that we've received from, um, uh, and I'm, I'm speaking on behalf of Start 360, but but um, also more generally uh, from a NIADA perspective, uh, we we have got um, uh, from a PHA per perspective uh, really good support um, in in terms of working closely with them as we start to transition our services from uh, face to face. To face-to-face um, -to, -face to um, uh, remote engagement, um, the PHA as well um, also has extended our funding uh, to December 2021. We were due uh, most of our contracts in terms of, of uh, drug and alcohol services were due for um, uh, re-procurement, um, right. and, and as a result, those. The, those uh, contracts have been extended, which has given us uh, and our staff some comfort oh, Marie, uh, sorry, in terms. Sorry. And, oh, and again, this would be sorry. from a Start 360 perspective. Um, our contracts with the Trust uh, have continued as well. Um, and for some of our staff, we continue to deliver face-to-face um, -face across the prison service. That contract uh, is delivered by the South Eastern Health and Social Care Trust. Um, and we have our staff have been redeployed within the prisons to work as part of um, the trust surge plan. So um, we are not at this point in time delivering the services that we were contracted to. Although we will, um, we are we, we are uh, doing our usual um, committal and. Uh, 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 meetings with, with prisoners that are, are soon to be released. But in the main, our services are being delivered through primary health care surge plan. Uh, and again, the mental health team within the prisons, um, they're, they're very, it's very, very busy indeed. 
uh, in, the, in the community, um, our contracts with trust. Uh, again, um, we've had great support there. We are part of their surge plan, and uh, some of our staff now have been redeployed into children's homes um, to to uh, d- deliver uh, again on on trust uh, surge plans there. So, um, I, I mean, as as the rest of the Nyada members have highlighted, uh, the one of the big positives um, out of out of this, um, and, and certainly from from a personal point of view, um, Star 360 point of view, a great positive has been the um, the joint uh, working approach, the partnership work and collaboration approach between um, the Trust PHA and ourselves. And um, again, what we would note personally would be um, opportunity uh, and uh, almost immediate access to any concerns or worries. Uh, and we would be um, in regular contact uh, with um, PHA and um, our trust funders. Okay, thank you, Anne Marie. Anne Marie, if I could just, uh, if you could stay a wee bit <coughs> back from your microphone there, there's a bit of feedback on your line, I think it is. So okay. we're very often asking members to keep their to keep <coughs> up close to the microphone, but in this case, just a slightly back, maybe, please. Okay, will do. Thank, thank you, and thank you for that response and uh, some good positives in there um, in relation to that. In its open letter to the Times, the Transform Drug Policy Foundation has called for more urgently. However, the department has advised the committee previously that services during the COVID pandemic must be managed within existing resources, albeit with some reconfiguring as required. So in in your view, panel, are services sufficiently resourced to cope and are there additional pressures on the services specifically at this time as a result of the pandemic? So over to the panel there. Who, which of you would like to lead on, on that one? I think Colin, I, I can um, speak from my experience of obviously our, our services in Belfast. Um, is that, is that, uh, that highlighted Mal? earlier. Is that Mal, sir? Sorry, it's, it's Alex from the Alex? Oh, okay. It's Alex Bunting. Thank you, yeah. Thanks, Alex. Yeah, go ahead, Alex, please. Okay. Yeah. Um, as I, as I highlighted, there there was a gap in the, the commissioning framework for Belfast services, so it has received over the past four to five years significantly less um, from the public health agency in terms of the step two services, and that was down to when uh, the commission had taken place. Obviously, FASA was a, a huge part of the drug and alcohol um, sort of arena in Belfast. So with that going, there was no um, sort of replacement funding or services recommissioned to, to place or to replace that gap. So Addiction and I have been operating a service which is oversubscribed but doesn't have the capacity to, to deal with the amount of service users coming forward or being referred from uh, professionals. So we have had additional support from public health agency, but they are restricted in the support that they can give us in, in terms of an uplift. Um, so there is an issue in Belfast around step three services. And from the pandemic, what we have seen as outlined is that increase in alcohol use, and we are seeing the professional referrals increase, and also then the development of significant waiting list. Um, so, from our from our experience, that's just one issue for us. Um, the other issue, obviously, is we have a huge program in the Western Trust, which has been lottery funded for the past five years, called Drinkwise as Well, hugely resourced uh, program and well reser- researched um, and backed up by evidence in terms of its delivery. That has received a six-month extension until September. That program will will then cease. Um, so that will be an older focus program, which is supporting around 115 people per week, um, and, and that again will go. So, in terms of our perspective in addiction and I, there is significant concerns around the amount of service required to address the referrals that we receive and the end of some of the the funding that lottery. Um, have put in that other commissioners haven't, or the commission and framework hasn't been in line to pick up. Okay, thank you. Colin, um, yeah. I'm Marie McClure. Yeah, um, I, I would echo all that um, Alex has said. Um, they, there are gaps in services, and again, those particularly um, that the lottery um, had been funding through the impact of alcohol. Start 360 have been delivering a, a through care provision for uh, prisoners uh, coming out 
uh, particularly those with alcohol, and it was extended to drug use. Uh, the outcomes uh, were um, uh, extremely positive, uh, not only in terms of drug and alcohol, but uh, desistance in offending behaviour. And after five years of support, um, although there was an appetite and, a, 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 and, a, and obviously a recognition of the work that was done through that through care um, provision that was supporting prisoners of all ages coming out of, of prison with, with addiction issues uh, and, and putting, around, putting around them an intensive program uh, for up to six months post-release. Uh, but again, um, and I think it was the case for all of the lottery uh, impact of alcohol uh, provision, uh, again, uh, uh, very little of any of that uh, uh, was mainstreamed, leaving a, a, a massive gap in provision. Okay, thank you, Anne Marie. And um, yeah, I do, and I know, I know, I have been engaged with with Drinkwise as well, and they have done terrific work across the Western Trust. So that is, that is yeah. It's Mal here. Can I just come in, like, you know, just very briefly, on a couple of points there? Yeah. Um, it's it's just a flag. I mean, traditionally, if you look back at the history of of, of opiate use and heroin use in particular, when there's been recessions, there's been a surge in use. And obviously, when we come out of this and, and moving through this, there could potentially be another growth in terms of the use of heroin in our, in our major cities. And I think we have seen massive growth in the last few years in terms of the use of drugs and IV drug use. So it's just to, to put a, a sort of marker down that this potentially we could have more issues with heroin as we move forward here uh, and access to treatment will be even more important. And I suppose from Extern's point of view, we've had great support from the PHA, but to, to be honest, the, the Trust have, have not shared a lot of communication, especially around working with IV drug users. And I think it's something that, you know, we'd like to flag. We need to learn from other models in, in, in Europe and, and wider than that on how they deal with this issue because it's not going to go away. Right. So thanks. Okay, thank you. Thank you, panel. Um, I'm going to go now this morning to our members on the phone who, who have uh, obviously, by members ringing in, has allowed us to maintain the social distancing and keep the meetings going throughout. So they are at a bit of a disadvantage. So I'll go to the members on the phone first and then I'll come to members in the room. So I'll start off with Orlea there. Orlea, are you on the line? Yes, thank you, Chair. Uh, Orlea, before you start, if I could, if I could remain members, if we could just maybe do two quick questions each in a, in a round, and then if we get additional time, but we have another session, so uh, we'll, we'll go with two questions maybe in this round. So, Orlea, go ahead, please. Yes, thank you. And I suppose from the the um, feedback that we got there from the presentations, most of the, the the core issues that I had down that I wanted to address was around the the opioid substitution therapy, the the issue around the homeless. Um, and, and the alcohol, so it was interesting that you've already addressed them in each of the presentations. But uh, and it's good to hear about the, the PHA. You see, with the um, you were saying, Amory, around the flexibility around your contracts, because yep. we've had some good feedback as well within some of the suicide prevention groups. It's important that you have that flexibility because you are going to have an additional pressure. I'm conscious that the um, you know the, the, the all of the three trust inpatient units have closed. The Northlands and Carlisle House um, have closed, so you are obviously having additional pressures yourselves and dealing with, with what you what you are working with. So well done for all the work you have been doing. Um, but my question would be around um, a few of the panel had mentioned around this um, return to high risk um, drug use and um, a, a rise in poly drug use. And again, I'm just thinking with some of the, the comparisons with the, the death by suicide. Are you, are you sensing, are you picking up any rise or reduction in the number of drug deaths? Now, I know in Belfast, some of the averages um, are down. Um, now, that's not to say, you know, we don't know what's ahead of us, but it's just a wee sense of, of the number of deaths, if you have any information on that. And then, secondly, the stuff around the alcohol is massive. It came up at the all-party group and suicide prevention the other day as well. And, of course, that's going to be a longer-term issue that we're going to have to deal with. But without a doubt, there, there has been increased alcohol consumption probably right across um, society from the lockdown. So um, the public health agency have said that they are working on some messages um, around that issue. But do you think that it's enough? And what else could we be doing? Because, as I said, it's going to be affecting so many homes 
Um, and, you know, there's going to be so many repercussions from this, you know, domestic violence, mental health, all of it. Um, so what more could we be doing, even in the short to medium term? Um, and just to point on the crisis de-escalation centre that someone had mentioned in Derry, we have a meeting on that later in the week. So, again, that, that's been flagged up as a concern. So, um, I mean, the, the, uh, even the stuff around the, the, the commission and get in, in Belfast, um, I think Ali Chu had mentioned that. Um, this is where we need to get focused on the new strategy. We had the pre-consultation in June. So we need to be making sure that we're clearing up any gaps now. So you are in a good place you know, to deal with any increase made. Thank you. Thank you, Arlea. And I'll go then to the panel. To, uh, could one of the panel pick up on those <coughs> points, please? Um, I'm Marie McClure. Um, Arlea, I, I wouldn't have um, the number of um, suicides related to drugs and alcohol at hand, but um, I would have an understanding that there have been some, particularly um, recently, there has uh, there have been. I know of one death, uh, which was um, just uh, 24 hours post release, um, in relation again to. Um, uh, overdose and uh, naloxone was what was used, but unfortunately, um, um, the uh, the person did not survive. And um, we um, in Start 360 have um, seen an increase of um, suicidal ideation and crisis situations. And again, I, I have to. Um, uh, recognise that uh, work we have been working with the police in, in, in some of these instances where um, young people have activated their end of, of life plan, and thankfully for good uh, as a, a result of good collaborative working, um, thankfully um, those plans um, uh, you know uh, were were, um, were, cu were 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 stopped, um, and 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 we are working with those um, with those. With those individuals more intensely, it is difficult to engage remotely, um, and, and obviously that you know working with families and that are, are de deprived and disadvantaged, working confidentially is is extremely difficult. But I'd like to, I mean, it was in our briefing paper, and Alex has already um, introduced it. The big issue. Um, and I think could help because, I mean, the alcohol consumption in the general population has definitely increased. We know that from the amount of alcohol that's being sold. And um, if, it's, if it's increased in the general population, it is definitely increased among those who are more vulnerable. The issue for us in engaging is the lack of digital capacity. And it's not just digital capacity, it's access. You know, I mean, a lot of our clients will have smartphones, but they don't have internet they would have had they would have used the internet of, of, of um, shopping centers libraries and um, mcdonald's kentucky whatever they don't have that access anymore so i i mean actually getting the messages um to to the general population is so much easier to get it to those that are most impacted i mean uh, the COVID 19 um you know, is magnified within um, the groups of people that we serve, that NIADA and our members serve. Uh, these are uh, some of the most complex and chaotic individuals in our society. And, to, and, and I mean, so it's getting, you know, getting those messages to them. We're, we're doing wonderful work, don't get me wrong, in terms of working remotely as best we can, and, and some of that has to be you know, garden gate front door um, for, for some of our clients. But that, but, but as organizations, we too have to support and protect our key workers, our frontline workers. So um, I, there, I think definitely there needs to be more conversations about how we can do that and, and do that better. Thank you, Anne-Marie. Um, yeah. It's Ian Cameron here from Eckstein. Could I yes, come in on a few points there, just? Go ahead, Ian, please, yeah. Thank you. Um, a, a couple of points um, around OST um, that have been brought up, and Mal had, had spoken about the potential increase in the heroin use coming out of COVID-19. Um, I operate and manage uh, a, a number of projects in Belfast, um, 
Street and Jacker Support Service, which is an outreach service that provides needle exchange and support to those who are street injecting, and also our dual diagnosis service, which provides um, a service to those who have severe and durable mental health issues, um, homelessness, and uh, drug and or alcohol problems. Firstly, we've, we have noticed an increase in the mental health presentation of people. Um, in fact, our dual diagnosis team was called in by the PSNI um, negotiators. They're Two weeks ago, um, where one of our clients had, had claimed a, a, a crane in the city centre and was, was going to end his life, and that was a, a, a brilliant work of, of cooperation between um, ourselves and the PSNI, which then went on to, you know, to, to ultimately save that guy's life. Now, his, his backstory is that you know he also has a, an opiate dependence through COVID-19. We have identified on the ground that there's approximately 25 to 35 individuals um, who are opiate dependent, who would benefit greatly from opiate substitution at that point in time. The PSN that we worked along and we do work along with the PSNI um, and have done through through this, a lot of those clients were being issued with um, fines on the street because they. Um, through great work of the housing executive, a lot of these clients had been previously homeless, but through great work of the housing executive, they were given premises, um, but they were routinely breaking the um, the COVID restrictions because they, they had to come out to, to access opiates and to access drugs and, and money. Um, and as Mal has said, we had um, made representation to Michael McBride in, in relation to that. And, at that point in time, substitution therapies had, had been stopped throughout Northern Ireland. Um, Mal has, has correctly said that the Belfast Trust has now picked up on that and, and they are going to start um, re-inducting new, new clients. Uh, but I also have a concern that um, as the lockdown um, sort of ceases, people's risk of overdose will increase. During COVID, people's uh, tolerance to drugs will have, have reduced, particularly to opiates. And whenever drug use is then reinstated or increased, there, I think there, there is a potential for a dramatic increase of overdose um, deaths with, within the city. Um, and we had proposed that, uh, like other parts of the UK and Ireland, that a, a low dose prescribing could be introduced at, or introduced at this time, and that will get people engaged in treatment, but it will also prevent um, the chance of overdose on the other side of, of this. Um, I, I'd like to echo as well that we've, we've had great support from the Public Health Agency and from Belfast City Council through the Police and Community Safety Partnerships. Both of, of those um, organisations and groups have supported us financially to to keep our services running and our face-to-face -face services running um, through this pandemic. Um, so there is great work being done, but I think we can we can also um, there's other things we can be doing. And I I think Belfast Trust and other trusts maybe need a resource um, potentially to, to to look at at some of this now and going on into the, into the future. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Ian. Um, okay, I'll go then now to Alex Easton. Alex, are you on the phone there at the present? Yes, thank you. Can you hear me? Yep, go ahead, Alex. Okay, um, first of all, thank uh, the panel for their presentation. Um, um, thank you for the important work that you do within the community. It, it's absolutely vital. Um, so, two quick questions. The first one is to Alex. Um, you mentioned about an increase in referrals um, during this period. Um, do you have, or does the panel and the different organisations have the resources to cope with that increase? And what are those uh, resource gaps that you have? And the second question, I think it might be for Ian, if to do, um, you mentioned about various drugs and that they have to send them off to Wales to find out the content. Um, I find that uh, very interesting, and 
I'm disappointed to hear that you can't do that in Northern Ireland, so uh, you can get a quicker response. But uh, be so that information could be maybe got out there, which would maybe help those who are addicted um, not take those type of uh, drugs, but also um, help to deter suppliers in it to an extent. Um, can you tell me, have you been in contact with anyone from either the PSNI or the health department about this? Um, and have you had any um, help towards maybe trying to get that set up in Northern Ireland where drugs can be assessed and you can get that information quicker? Thank you, Alex. And uh, go across then again to the panel and the first part of Alex's question on resource gaps and then on the testing issue. So, which of the panel would like to start off? Okay, I can answer Alex's first question. That's Alex from Addiction NI. Um, hi, Alex. Hi. Um, um, it's, it's, it's a bit of a, a problem for us because obviously the, the gap is there previous to the, the issue of the, the pandemic coming on top of it. Um, and the, the issue for us is that the treatment plans that we have and the referral, the referral rates coming in don't match up. So basically what happens is you, you develop a waiting list. So um, we don't have enough resources to address the referrals as they were. When I say about increases, we've seen increases in, in referrals coming from professionals. We've actually seen a slowdown in some referrals, uh, in particular uh, self-referrals. So people aren't referring themselves in the services, but they are coming via professionals um, or just um, and you know there, there, there is a, a lot of work going on, a lot of good work going on in, in terms of the partnerships that we have, for example, with the Belfast Trust and, and the hub, uh, the referral hub that they have. Um, and you know we're trying to address things as, as best we can. But what we're also seeing, Alex, I think, which is resource intensive, is the added uh, social needs of our clients, and we're trying to link them up with local resources and keep them connected. And we're also seeing increased levels of social isolation from an existing group which is already isolated in the community. Um, so I think that that adds on another layer of support, another layer of resource that probably generally wouldn't have been, not that it wasn't required in the past, but it, it was very much treatment focused. And we're now seeing probably exposure there of, of the social needs of our clients. Um, you know, For example, we see an awful lot of people talking a lot of, there about older adults Older adults who maybe sat in bars and had a few pints and went home to their their houses are now um, bringing you know crates of beer home and drinking at home, and that's causing all sorts of other issues in the home as well. Um, and we're getting increased amounts of, of calls from family members. So, you know, one of the things that we've done in the last week is we've been working with volunteer and I, um, looking at the option of, of creating an alcohol helpline, um, and we're looking at you know volunteer rules for that and induction rules and training rules so that we can bring suitably qualified people in to volunteer on, on um, an alcohol helpline. So that, that's one of the things that we're trying to do to address some of the con concerns and issues, maybe even for family members. So, you know, we do face challenges. There's no doubt um, that we will face challenges coming out of this. Um, and that's right across alcohol and drugs. And I would echo what Ian and Mal said around the injecting drug population. I think there could be an increased level of support required as we come out of lockdown. Yeah, okay, thank you. Hi, uh, Ian Cameron here again from Max Town. Hi, um, just, just on the question of testing, it was actually Owen Ryan um, who had initially spoke about testing, but if, if Owen doesn't mind, I can, I can answer some of those questions and he can come in then on the back of that, if that's okay. Yeah, certainly. Okay. Um, so, yeah, at the minute, the, the, the only access to testing that we have is through a program in, in Wales called the Webnos Project. Um, the, just quickly, the way that operates is we would receive a substance, an unknown substance. We package it into an envelope. It's given a code. It's posted off to a lab in Wales. It's then tested, and we receive the result via um, a web link, um, which we go into. And obviously, that takes considerable time for that to happen. Um, we have spoken um, at, from Extern and from NIADA, and we have spoken with PSNI, Public Health Agency and others in relation to having access to that type of testing here in Northern Ireland. Um, the, the P 
Gates and I are already under pressure with the drugs that they are uh, seizing and then having to have sent off to be tested uh, for criminal cases. So they are already at maximum capacity, over maximum capacity in fact, um, in relation to their ability to test for substances. So they, they don't have the ability to test substances purely if it's not in relation to a, a criminal case. Um, in relation to accessing that, that testing from somewhere else, the equipment, as I'm sure you appreciate, the equipment, it's a mass spectrometer testing is required, um, and that is extremely expensive. Um, and I, I, I think um, the Trust and the Public Health Agency have, have looked at that, but um, it, you know the, the, the finance uh, just isn't there for that. The, uh, the kind of only suggestion I would have in relation to that is that we, we possibly could have discussion with the Welsh, the Welsh project um, to see whether we could buy in extra spots for testing. Um, you know, obviously their system is set up uh, for their their needs, and it's it's really through goodwill at this stage that um, we have negotiated that that pathway. Um, but there may be some way that we could we could look at um, providing you know maybe help and support for the cost of their project to give us more access. If that makes sense. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, if I can come in there, it's Owen Ryan from yes, Simon Community, and just to I suppose, expand on what Ian had said around the test, and you know, I mean, the, the point, and, and I suppose the value of it that we have found is that where we have been able to get accurate information about the content of what people are taking and, and being able to relay that back to the users, it has had an impact in terms of their ability to modify, to, to, you know, to, to, to to act on that harm reduction advice. And as well, if we were able to have timely information around cause of death, we, 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 sadly we had um, a death in one of our Belfast hostels last week that appears to have been, um, and it's unconfirmed, but I mean, there the were um, blues or diazepam found in, in the young man's room. So, you know, the, the, there is a you know, fairly direct link there. Um, but we won't get information in terms of you know, the only confirmed cause of death, and this was that's an issue as well. You know, for, for a lot of the other services, you know, getting that information out there, being able to give in a timely manner, and being able to pass it on to our service users, you know, we can see the direct impact of that already. But just the, the samples we've been able to send off through webinars, and that information coming back, that we can, you know, provide that information directly to the service users. Okay. Thank you, Owen. Thank you. And, yeah, thank you, Alex. So I'm going now to our final member on the phone then is Pat Sheehan. Pat, are you there? Yes, Chair, thanks for that. Um, first of all, a couple of positive things have been, well, a number of positive things have been said. I just want to highlight a couple of them. Just that there's greater collaboration with the Trust and the PHA in, in the current context. That's, uh, that's excellent news. And when this crisis or emergency ends, I mean, that collaboration should continue, uh, and if it doesn't, it should be flagged up to us as politicians as soon as possible. The other thing I'm, uh, I'm glad to hear about is the alcohol helpline uh, haven't been set up, and I think that's going to be needed even after this finishes. If it, you know, you can imagine, and, and we all know that the, the sale of alcohol has increased, and there may be many reasons for people increasing their drink intake at this time, whether it be anxiety, isolation, or whatever. But when when you think some of the more mundane reasons that people are maybe working from home, they're not rushing to get the kids out to school in the morning. So previously, when they wouldn't open the bottle of wine on a Tuesday or Wednesday, they might say, well, there's no rush in the morning. So, you know, let's enjoy ourselves. And other people are, are saying, well, God knows what's going to happen is in this crisis, so we might as well enjoy ourselves. Anyway, that's just, just some observations. One sort of negative observation is that uh, I think it was Anne-Marie you mentioned that uh, a lot of these vulnerable people, although they have uh, smartphones, they don't have uh, uh, internet. And 
in the context of the 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 uh, contact tracing beginning, uh, that could be a difficulty if uh, we're going to be using the phone apps that have been much talked about, uh, and particularly if this is a vulnerable group who maybe don't pay as much heed to the social distancing uh, as, as, as others would. So, I mean, I think that's something that we have to, to keep in mind as well. But I suppose just coming on to a quick question, uh, well, two quick questions. No one has mentioned gambling yet, and I'm wondering if anybody uh, has any evidence, anecdotal or other ways, of any increase in gambling in this period, because I can just imagine that people who usually get their thrills, whether it's going to football matches or motorbike racing or mountaineering or whatever, uh, may be quite bored and uh, maybe get a kick out of uh, going online gambling or something. Uh, and, and the other issue is, come back to the home drinking, uh, are, are, are we expecting major problems uh, as a result of that as this uh, lockdown begins to ease? Thank you. Thank you, Pat. And across to our panel then, please, who wants to pick up on those issues? I call him it's Alex Bundy from Addiction NI. Um, Pat, just to touch on the, the, the gambling, um, obviously we're part of the Inspire group. And we ran a, um, a campaign, Addiction NI ran a campaign about three weeks ago, highlighting the impact of um, or the, and the risks associated with gambling. And we'll doing some work with Oshie McConville around that. The, the, the biggest concern we had was the increased levels of investment from those companies and how they were able to target people in lockdown and during lockdown. If you look at the TV screens every day and every night, during the day and night, it's bingo or it's all those online betting apps that have been you know, increasing um, their, their marketing budgets to particularly target people during this period. And I'm not too sure, you know, governmental, is there anything that, is there something could be done to try and restrict that in some ways, given that I think it's just trying to exploit vulnerable people at a vulnerable time. In terms of the increases, um, th there's no doubt, I think, that you know when we come out of this uh, and we look back at this, there, you will definitely see increases on online gambling and the use of online gambling apps, given that they've invested so heavily in their marketing strategy. So that is a concern. And on your other point with regards to lockdown and alcohol, I think probably people are now developing an issue which will need treatment here in the near future in the medium term. We need to prepare for that. We need to prepare for that equally for the impact that COVID-19 is going to have on, on the region. So I think we do consider what is our short-term the long-term plan to address the, the mental health needs of Northern Ireland. And we need to bear in mind that our mental health services receive between 5 to 6 percent of our health budget comparison to England, which receives 13 percent of its health budget directed towards mental health services. So we really do need to think about how we're funding mental health in this country. And I think that's a good starting point for, for any, any um, executive that needs to make huge decisions around our, our health spend. Uh, Pat, uh, I'm Ray yeah. McClure. Um, I'm, I'm, I would echo it and support everything that Alex has just said. Uh, one of our members, Dunlui Addiction Services, uh, delivers uh, gambling addiction services, uh, and uh, certainly from feedback, their, their, their services are continuing to support gamblers, um, and one of the biggest issues is the exploitation. If you're interested in more information, I can ask um, their director, Pauline Campbell, uh, to update you. Okay, thanks for that, Amory. Thanks, thanks for that, and I think that is touches on an issue that the committee have ex explored before in relation to the funding of mental health services. So, and um, that's certainly a, a concern. Um, so, I'm going to now come into the members here in the room. I'm going to go to Pam Cameron first of all, there as deputy chair, and then I have Paula, Jerry, Colin, and Alan in that order. So, Pam. Thank you, chair, and thank you, panel. Uh, and I just want to put on record my thanks to to those who have continued to work with those with addiction across our local communities during this unprecedented time of uh, public health crisis. So that's very welcome, thank you. Um, my two questions, the first one would be on um, 
I don't think anybody's mentioned yet um, PPE or potential need for PPE for staff and volunteers. And I'm thinking especially as restrictions start to ease. Um, obviously, with the scenario we've raised it at committee before, where social workers and the requirement they would have, and I can't see why um, the likes of your volunteers and staff members wouldn't have similar needs as um, as your work um, progresses and, and the restrictions of lockdown ease, and you may then be uh, coming face into face to face contact again. So, your comments around that, and my second question. Um, Owen raised the, the issue of overdoses and the fact that the overdoses um, decreased and then have increased. Obviously, there's been a, a gap of time, and then there's uh, the question of, of what is included in these uh, the drugs that are appearing. Um, so, I wanted to ask if um, if there's work ongoing with the likes of the PSMI uh, in terms of tracking down um, the production and creation of these what I would call fake drugs which are so dangerous so um, are, are you working with uh, the PSNI on, on those issues thank you thank you so across to our panel there for a response to those please uh, Hi, uh, Ian Cameron here yep. yeah go ahead Ian. Um, I just um, pick up on Pam's um, issue there around working along with the, the PSNI in relation to the fake drugs or, or the, the blues or whatever. Um, through, as Owen has highlighted when I spoke about earlier, the Wednos project, um, we have worked out a system now with uh, Belfast City Beat and the PSNI within the city centre um, that if there are drugs found and if our, if our workers are out and about and drugs are, are found, then we send them through to the Webinars project. Um, and as the one has highlighted, the valuable information that, that comes back with that. Um, I'm sure you're also aware, Pam, of the, the Damas alert system. So any information that, that we get on the ground in relation to uh, fake drugs or uh, drugs of very impurity or any risks or issues um, that is being highlighted through the DAMA system and the, the, the PS and I are also working alongside us to, um, to update that system and, uh, and then we, we, we try and make um, the service users aware um, of the, the dangers of, of some of the, the fake drugs and the, the stuff that, that are out there. But, on a daily basis, we, we work on the ground uh, with the PSN in relation to a lot of these issues. Um, I mean, we, we, we have a, a task group, actually, which is, is meeting right now, and I've a, I'm normally at it, and I have a colleague covering for me. Um, it's a, a Belfast City Centre tasking group where there are a number of um, groups, PSNI, the uh, PCSPs, Belfast City Council, Extern, the Welcome Centre, um, and various others from Belfast City Council meet weekly um, to talk about those issues and, and more. Um, and that has been happening now for the last two years. And that the cooperation um, at that level is, is, is amazing. Um, quite frankly, if, if you'd asked me two years ago or suggested to me that, that we would have this level of contact at this point, I would have thought it impossible. But the, the partnership work on that is, is happening um, with my projects and in relation to the city centre is, is fantastic. Thank you. And Anne-Marie, were you indicating there? Uh, yes. Uh, just to say, um, it's awfully hard to hear yourselves. Um, and Pam, I hope, I, I just, I hope I'm getting the right end of the stick here in terms of your question. Um, in terms of the PSNI, uh, NIADA have um, regular meetings with... Um, Neil McGuinness, Grovner Road, and that that has just been amazing since he's took up his post. Um, that level of communication sharing, information sharing, um, and you know, again, moving forward in a collaborative way. And to be fair, that was that had commenced well in advance of COVID. Um, the the other, the first, the first question around PPE, in terms, and I can only speak for our own staff here, in terms of. Um, 
our, our staff on the front line, the trusts have been providing PPE and scrubs and anything necessary for our staff. Um, as a result of the five-step approach, our organization has developed our own um, a, a, a action plan in alignment with that. What we would really like, and I think, I mean, I've heard it from all our, uh, my colleagues this morning, is that, I mean, our staff want to be out there, want to deliver face-to-face, want to do what we can, but obviously have to also, you know, apply the, the restrictions and regulations from the executive. We would really like to know, would really need, we, one thing that's missing from our action plan is, you know, a time frame. So within that, our organisation is looking to purchase our own PPE and make um, make the necessary uh, adjustments to our uh, workplaces. Thank you, panel. Um, and, and I just wanted to... Yeah. PPE as well. Sorry, it's Owen Ryan from the Simon community. Yeah. Um, I mean, obviously for our staff who have, you know, in the hostels have continued to provide and face-to-face services the whole way through the the, the pandemic. It's, it's quite a crucial issue, and particularly with the increase in overdose, where it's impossible to social distance when you're trying to save someone's life or when you're administering um, naloxone. So it is a real concern for us now. Thankfully, we, we, we've a partnership with the Trust who have been coordinating the provision of PPE. That was there was a deadline for that up to the 15th of May. They've agreed to extend that for a period of time, but we're not sure. And we're, I suppose we're waiting to hear, I think it's from the Department of Communities, on what alternative arrangements will be made. But again, it's just around the confidence of our staff to be able to you know, provide the, the, the crucial service that they have. You know, they, they need to be adequately um, equipped. And up to now, in fairness, you know, the trust has managed that pretty well. But um, I suppose we have a little concern in terms of as, as, as this period is extended. Okay. okay, thank you. Thank you, Owen. Uh, and, uh, uh, Colin, just quickly, I'm Marie McClure. Um, when I was looking at, at the cost of masks, the cheapest masks and buying them in bulk was 78p. Um, most providers um, are, are, are um, asking a pound a mask. I mean, you know, that is quite expensive, and I'm sure. If we work in a collaborative way and we were able to source PPE um, through through, um, through trusts, um, it would be much cheaper. Okay, thank you. Um, useful suggestion. And could I just ask? And, and I, I want to. Uh, express appreciation to the panel who are now running significantly over time and we also have an additional presentation coming up i think the it's a it's a, an indication of the level of concern and the wide range of issues arising but however if i could ask members if they have a key question um the the two is, is i suppose by way of suggestion rather than target if it is a key question we'll we'll try and get around all the members paula um thank you and good morning um panel uh, Two very quick questions. The first one was um, a few months ago I'd heard about the Public Health Agency's pilot of the nasal spray of naloxone and I'm just wondering is that continuing during this lockdown and would that be useful in terms of the Simon community and other hostels? Um, And the second one is the issue around the, the waiting list to get on the opiate substitution therapy. I asked an assembly question a couple of months back and the figures back were startling then. For example, in Belfast we had 41 people waiting to get on it. What is your understanding of the size of the waiting list now? Thank you. And over to panel, please. Over to our panel, please. Oh, Buff, you are Ian. Do you want to take that in terms of the waiting list? Yeah. Um, to be honest, we, we have no idea. And on the waiting list, um, we we don't know how long it's it's going to take. All all I I can work off, I suppose, is the the anecdotal information that I have on the ground and the, the, in relation to the numbers that we're working with. So as I said earlier, we've identified sort of roughly between sort of thirty to thirty five people who were either street homeless or within um, sort of in and out of the the, the hostel system. And that is by, by nowhere near um, the amount of, of people uh, you know out, outside of that who who would need treatment. So, and if the if Belfast Trust are talking about inducting two people a week, um, you know over the next uh, if you have thirty people, then you know that that's extending in in the months. Um, but it's, it's certainly the. We are, the waiting list continues to grow, um, and 
and I think that's that's just going 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 to continue um, after after COVID. Thank you. And yep, was there another part there? The nasal spread. The nasal spread. Well, I think maybe on the sorry, it's Owen Ryan here, and uh, lock the nasal spray pilot. Um, we had an initial discussion around that pilot, um, and then COVID nineteen happened, so it, it hasn't. It, it, it's been postponed, um, and we're waiting to hear, you know, in terms of time frames. But, you know, in, in conversation recently, um, I, I've been told that it is definitely going to happen. It's just, I suppose, the time frames have been pushed back as a result of the the crisis we're currently going through. So, so I'm not sure in terms of how soon that can happen. It hasn't happened yet, but it it is on the on the agenda to happen pretty soon. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for that. Tell me a goal with Jerry and Ish. Yeah, Jerry, no worries. Please. Uh, thanks, panel. Um, I've heard it said that uh, addiction is not an equal opportunity disorder because it can obviously more affect anybody, but it affects people in the prey there is uh, more uh, acutely. Um, I think there's a body of research, I think it was alluded to by uh, Alex, I think, uh, about um, addiction being higher amongst people who are unemployed. Uh, I, would, I would assume it's something similar here. Uh, and Mal referred to uh, the, the likelihood uh, or the, the possible certainty of a deep recession. Um, some reports are saying the worst in 300 years. And just for, for, for notification, um, in, the, in the 1929 US Depression, uh, the suicide rates increased by 50% in one year. So potentially we're looking at a, a, a massive spike. So I'd be, I'd be concerned that we don't have enough funding as is um, for these services. Does a panel think we need some kind of emergency injection uh, of cash in the mental health services to uh, deal with the likely a spike in referrals that uh, is po possibly and probably going to come uh, at the end of this crisis? Thank you. Over to the panel, please. Hi, it's it's Hi, Mal. Yeah. It's Alex Mon. It's, 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 no, I'm just going to say. I mean, Alex has alluded to to the, the underfunding of, of mental health services recently, and I would agree with everything that Jerry said there. I think most of us as as providers have seen the the increase in suicidal ideation, low mood, anxiety, um, and I think that you're right. We are going to face much more problems in, in terms of this um, as we move through the lockdown easing and then hopefully at the end of that into into more whatever the new normal is so i i think you know if we could get ahead of the curve and maybe look at how we fund that uh, and at various different levels from education and awareness to actual response i think uh, you're right traditionally outbound folks um, will become an even bigger problem that will lead to more mental health problems and i think there's no doubt that we're going to face a probably prolonged spike in this in terms of both access to, to treatment. And we already in Exeter and running fairly significant wait on this, which I know a lot of the other providers alluded to earlier. Uh, and that, that's just the nature of things. We've always had wait on this, but it's going to be even, even more hard now. And I think I'll, I'll, I'll let Alice take that up. But yes, I, would, I think we should maybe look at some quite pragmatic uh, approaches to mental health and, and to maybe trying to to lessen the impact of this in the end. So, thank you. And Alex, then please. Yeah, I mean, we we'll agree with what Mal says. I mean, Jerry, it's back to that whole thing that we have all the evidence there. If you look at, you know, the work that Marmot did around health inequalities, and he says that you know, health inequalities track social inequalities, and there there is absolutely no doubt when you look at the statistics of Northern Ireland that those most impacted by social inequalities actually have greater impact on their health inequalities, and that includes addiction, and that's right across the board. And also the suicide ideation, the impact of suicide. So, you know, I, I do think we really do need to consider the impact that this is going to have. Um, it, it's not that we don't have communities that already have come through significant issues in the past that will, again, layer on top of the trauma that we're, we're going through now, and I think they will be disproportionately hit um, as a result of that. Um, I'm Marie McClure. Um, Jerry, um, I mean, there is a wealth of evidence that we've collected over the years. The Bamford report, in, in which many of those recommendations uh, did not move forward. And then we had a, a future search in Belfast, uh, where not only drug and alcohol, but uh, the, the knock-on effect on mental health were also um, uh, considered. 
uh, and of which uh, I think there was a, a, a upwards on 20 recommendations made, uh, none of which have been implemented. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Coming now to Alan. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Um, just to ask the, the panel, uh, is it inevitable uh, that there will be a huge increase in demand uh, for all of their mental health support services as we start to come out of this pandemic and indeed in the early months of the, the new normal uh, as a direct consequence uh, of this crisis and the impact that it has been having on society? And a second, just quick question. I realise they're not qualified to give me a definitive answer, but do any members of the panel have a sense that the sales of illegal drugs on the street has been disturbed by the, uh, the lockdown? Thank you, Alan. And across to our panel, please, for that. I'm awfully sorry. Sorry, I'm Marie McClure here, but unfortunately I didn't catch anything Alan said. Um, the first part of Alan's question was, is there inevitably going to be increased demand coming out of the pandemic for the services that, that you all provide? And the second part was, has there been any evidence that the supply of drugs on the street has been disrupted as a result of the pandemic? Is that fair enough, Alan? Yep. Yep. Okay. So have you got that? Did you get that, Anne Marie? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yes, I'll explain to you, Alan. I suppose what, when we look at all of this, you know, we, we definitely see um, evidence. You know, if we look at SARS, we look at what's happened in Wuhan. They had to bring in psychological first aid, psychological therapies because of the impact on mental health. And we know that people's mental health is impacted on that the rates of addiction and the rates of drug use increases. Um, so I think it's fair to say that we do expect a, an increase uh, she's rate of our, of our services, um, and I think that's something that we need to consider in any action plan moving forward. And, and I think it just needs also then be underpinned by how mental health and addiction services work moving forward, because I think there's a lot of the partnership working um, that happened from the, the, the pandemic shows that we can do very, very positive things together from the statutory services and the community voluntary sector. And I think if we can carry that forward, I do think additional resources are required, but I, I accept that we're in a very, very challenging time and everybody will be competing for those resources. Thank you. And then the Alan, yeah. uh, Ian Cameron here. Ian, thank you. Just in relation to your, your question about the disruption of, of drug activity or availability, um, our, our team's on the ground. Um, I, I personally was expecting to see uh, a reduction in the availability, particularly of, of, of heroin, um, but we, we actually haven't seen that. The heroin seems to be just as available now as it did before the pandemic started. But what has changed is people's um, opportunities, for want of a better term, to access money to, to buy substances. So we have seen people not being able to afford to buy heroin, changing uh, then onto, as Owen, uh, Owen and I alluded to earlier, onto other other drugs, particularly the benzodiazepines, um, alcohol, pregabalin, um, and some of the other prescribed medications, which we know we already have a, a problem and an issue with. Um, that is, is probably uh, would explain some of the reason why there was a, a drop in, in overdose and then that increase in overdose again because as people were not able to afford their heroin, um, over, overdose of, of opiates reduced, but as then people started to use alcohol, benzodiazepines, gabapentinoids and heroin, the polydrug use, um, gruesome foursome as, as we would call it, um, that's why we've seen an increase then uh, of, of overdoses again. But, um, and this feeds into the, 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 the second part uh, of, the, of the first part of the question in relation to is it inevitable that we will see greater problems? I, I think the answer to that is yes. Um, prior to the pandemic, we were already seeing um, an increase in our problematic drug use. Uh, and as you've heard from everybody this morning, we're all already operating um, waiting lists um, and treatments 
are, are difficult um, to access and, and to get into, some more than others. Uh, but there, there's no doubt in my mind that, that this is going to impact greatly on all forms of addiction right across the board, which will then impact greatly on people's mental health. Okay, thank you very much, panel. Um, thank you for that pr presentation and those very direct answers to the questions. Um, I want to uh, wish you all well in the important and complex work that you're undertaking at this particularly and uniquely challenging time in what was already a very challenging field. Um, so thank you for, for presenting today, and there are many issues there that we will now be, I think, better equipped to consider in the future as a result of this. So it's been, it's been very worthwhile Thank you, and all the best for now. So I'm live. Thank you. Members, thank you. Thank, thank, you. You. thank you. Take care. Bye. Take care. Thank you. Bye. Thank you all. So, members, we now need to get our next presentation lined up on the phone. So I propose we take a short break and come back at quarter past 12. That's okay. Thank you. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed.
This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound.
This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed.
This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. Okay, uh, welcome back there everyone and thank you for rejoining us and um, just so we're now on to our second presentation members in, in relation to our COVID-19 disease response work and we're getting today an update from the independent health and care providers on the issue of care homes. I refer members to papers at tab 6 of the pack and a briefing note at tab 6.5 of your table papers. So can I welcome to our meeting this morning Ms Pauline Shepherd, Chief Executive of Independent Health and Care Providers. Uh, good morning Pauline and would you now please go ahead and brief members on the, on the current situation in your sector. Thank you very much Chair. Firstly thank you for the invitation to brief the committee. Um, by way of introduction, IHCP is a membership organisation representing independent providers of care, home and home care services, and the membership includes private not-for-profit charity and church-affiliated organisations. Um, the scope is that independent sector provides 15,000 of the 16,000 care home beds and around 70% of home care services in Northern Ireland. Um, I did do a briefing um, back to the Health Committee on the 19th of March and it covered a wide range of issues as a result of COVID and at that time the information related to both the care home and home care services but my focus today, Chair, as you mentioned, is primarily on care homes where the virus is particularly challenging. Home care services have not been affected to the same degree as care homes and IHCP is currently gathering information from home care providers on how the COVID has been managed and monitored in the, the family home setting. So that's another area that might be of interest at a later stage. Um, I'm going to initially provide an update on the issues raised on the 19th of March. And at that time, we were very early into um, the, the, the problems arising um, with the pandemic. Um, PPE was a particular concern, and the provision and delivery of PPE was very slow to start, with initial guidance issued on the 17th of March stating that really the independent sector needed to source its own and then in the event that it couldn't source it to contact the trust if necessary. PP eventually started to flow around mid-April after some concern about clarity and alignment of guidance. Um, this was greatly improved, it's greatly improved now, um, but there have been some recent concerns about quality with some recalls and some of the products, but we're in a much better position now than we were back in March. Um, surge planning and staff deployment, I raised concerns. I expressed reservations about the engagement with the sector and the testing and mobilisation of plans for staff deployment across sectors, which we were challenging, saying that those needed to be tested. We've just recently been engaged in these formal plans with actions running over the next number of weeks. Um, from an early period of time, there was a willingness from Trust to provide staff, but this lacked a mechanism to actually make it happen. So hopefully there will now be monitoring systems in place and clarity on how support will be provided. And reports from care homes at the minute are that staff support is working very well now. On the continuity of service throughout and beyond the pandemic, financial support has been provided and there are further ongoing issues under consideration um, around additional funding for staff on sick leave due to um, isolating. And we're very, um, we welcome the, the move that, and the ministerial statement in relation to that. On testing, um, which has um, been given quite, quite a lot of attention, obviously, pre-admission to care homes was a concern that I raised on the 19th of March. And the testing policy um, at that point was inconsistent between trusts. Uh, we pressed for pre-admission testing for care homes. Um, the rollout of the staff testing was welcome and effective in returning staff to work that have been off self-isolating. However, there has been a risk with the testing policy when it was initially only applied to symptomatic residents and staff. We know that people have, that can have this virus, 
and show no symptoms at all. Uh, the further increasing in testing of all residents and staff has been continued to be progressed um, with you know, obviously the ministerial announcements that you, you'll be aware of. There needs to be further clarity in terms of timing and the process for this to happen, particularly the repetition of tests, and we're still asking questions around how often tests will be repeated. We now need to work together to provide clear instructions both to providers and also clarity to the public because obviously families are asking these questions of care homeowners and we don't have the answers to be able to give them. Moving on to um, another issue that was raised on the 19th of March, restricted visiting and the impact on residents and families, particularly those with dementia and learning disabilities. The impact on these groups needs to be assessed and given that the restricted visiting may be with us for some time, we need to find a way through this together um, to be able to balance the risk um, and also um, balance the need for family contact. So we really need the PHA and the department to work with us on this issue. Um, for instance, is it an option that a family member living um, or, um, with, um, you know, in, a, in a care home with a, a family member? Um, can we allow a visit under restrict, or really strict controls and PPE testing risk assessments? Um, it's a critical piece of work that obviously needs family to be in, in, engaged. Um, around that, um, obviously, as the relaxation of the community lockdown increases, that will increase the risk in terms of transmission um, into care homes, which is another um, critical area that needs to be needs to be monitored very closely. Uh, at the time, the 19th of March, I mentioned about re regulations and registration, and that was about recruiting people and being able to uh, uh, recruit people quickly. All of those issues were addressed very, very quickly, very promptly with um, the NISC and with various other bodies, and we are now able to recruit quite quickly into the workforce. Uh, communication was also raised, and that still is a problem. Um, we need to get um, to a regional approach for issues rather than a, on an individual trust basis. Um, there is a lot of um, interpretation and different interpretations of, of guidance, and it could be made a lot more streamlined. So those were, that's a quick update on the issues from the 19th of March. Um, I'm going to move on, if that's okay, on to sort of the current focus um, and where we are at this point in time. Um, the, the Minister made a number of announcements on the 13th of May in relation to um, ramping up the testing, and that is very welcome. And we welcome a lot of the, the comments and the statements that the Minister has made on the 13th of May. But the priority now is that we need to reduce the potential for transmission of the virus within care homes um, that currently have it and try to reduce, reduce the risk of it entering care homes that don't have it. And that is the, the critical um, areas for, for all of us to work on. We do have a question around antibody testing. Um, so far, COVID testing of staff and residents in itself will not tackle this issue, and there needs to be urgent consideration of antibody testing, and again, how, um, how effective that is and how valid it might be. If there was an antibody test, we might be able to have that higher assurance of um, staff um, not being able to trans transfer and indeed residents not being able to transfer the virus. The rolling programme in relation to repeat testing, the testing will need to be repeated on a regular basis and it, it will only give a picture or a view at a point in time. So obviously we need to be able to um, know how often that's going to be done and, and how regularly. Um, human rights issues also been mentioned by the Minister and there will be clear challenges in carrying out what's quite an intrusive test on people who are unable to consent or understand what, what the test is about. Um, moving on to the Safe at Home project, which the Minister, I believe, mentioned in his briefing yesterday. Um, the Department are currently seeking volunteer homes to participate in staff live-in options, and they have communicated out to care homes to actually volunteer to, to, to pilot that. Um, there, there is a problem with it that the pilot that was referred to by the Minister um, there was not, the, the unions have not agreed and will not support the staff in live-in options. Um, so any um, pilot with that will have to have a full volunteer sign-up, which will be difficult to staff and difficult to manage. So that's an area we need to, we need to sort of keep an eye on. On pre-admission testing, um, the uh, arrangement for the 48-hour test to be done prior to hospital discharge is welcome. And that policy seems to be working well so far. 
also um, we look forward to the Northern Ireland Ambulance Service and the, the nurses um, being available for the mobile testing. Um, this process still has to be you know, communicated through, but the approach is very welcome and if it can be initiated quickly and, and we get the, those tests out there. They may already be out there, I'm not quite sure, but um, that, that's a very welcome step in the, in the right direction. The Minister also mentioned yesterday the hospital to community outreach teams. And again, we need to have a bit more, more detail around that. Um, but again, care homes are, are, are very um, open to whatever support they can get from the hospital um, into, into, the, into the community and, and into care homes. Um, the Minister also mentioned in his statement on the 13th of May the need for reform and investment in social care. Um, we haven't ha been involved in any discussions with the Department on that at the minute and what that might look like. But I did hear him mention that um, social care, care homes and home care has very much been the Cinderella service in the past. And um, it is unfortunate that it's taken this pandemic to actually um, highlight um, the pressures that, that, that this sector has been under prior to coming into the pandemic. So we look forward to working um, with the department in, in taking those reforms um, forward and also in relation to the training and terms and conditions standardised uh, standardization, uh, career paths and improved um, wages. Um, again, with no discussions on what that might look like at this point in time, but it very much fits with proposals that we've been having and putting to the Health and Social Care Board for the past number of many years to say that um, the career pathways um, need to be improved, the wages need to be improved, so that very much aligns with what our views are. Um, and finally, just to conclude, um, we agree that there's total absolute need for reform in the social care sector um, with action to be taken on um, the many independent reports over the past number of years, um, including um, the focus needs to be on an independent econo economic review and to possibly a market regulator. We know there are concerns about um, profit um, and um, care homes and home care um, making profit, and we, we want to be able to demonstrate that um, this is an effective a method of delivering quality services within the independent sector. We need to work together to shape what care is going to be needed in the future and what it's going to be like in the future because and undoubtedly services particularly will be different coming out the other end of this pandemic. And just a final note will be um, on the home care services. Um, there needs to be attention in the home care services when families return to work. Um, we anticipate that a lot of the care home packages that were um, cancelled will need to be put back in place. So there's an area there that needs, needs um, further, probably, attention. And that um, is a very quick run through an update. I was hoping to do it quickly so that you can have time for questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Pauline, and thank you for, for your brevity as well, but also your clarity. I think it's, it's a very, very good update. I think the committee will welcome that. I think we particularly welcome the fact that you've outlined a number of improvements that have taken place since that 19th of March meeting, and, and I think the committee would be glad that, that, that those matters have been addressed um, and, and that we can now can focus on other serious matters which continue to cause concern, and obviously the overall situations within the care homes concerns us all. Many of our most vulnerable residents um, who are vulnerable both in terms of the residential setting and, and the difficulties that provides, but also in, in terms of their own age and comorbidities and all that. So it's a, an area of huge concern for us, and, and this is a timely session in that regard. Um, you had referred there to, your, to one of your issues outstanding was around the issue of COVID-19 entering the care home sector. Could you outline for the committee how you, you would su suggest what measures could be taken to improve or reduce the lack, the reduce the ability for COVID-19 to enter these vulnerable settings? Well, I think um, the, the testing is obviously the, the, the key issue. Um, the testing in terms of testing all staff and testing all residents. Um, there needs to be a repetition of that test. We already have um, controls in place around taking um, uh, temperature checks and running temperature checks through residents and staff. However, we all know that um, this virus can be particularly difficult to identify and lots of people may have it and may be asymptomatic. So th th there is a real challenge in actually trying to ensure that um, the virus does not 
either come into a care home or, or transfer around it. Hence my concern that as the lockdown you know, lifts and is relaxed within the community, that I think will increase um, where care um, workers are coming in and out. They may be asymptomatic and there's no way of actually um, testing and checking whether they are actually carrying the virus or not. And that's where we need the medical and the scientific um, guidance in terms of the testing and the repetition of testing and how valid, um, how valid uh, and accurate that is in terms of ensuring that someone does not have the virus. Okay. And in terms of step down from hospital or discharge from hospital or indeed step up prior to admission to a care home, are there issues there that could be improved upon? The issues there are in relation to the, the I mean, we, we were accepting and we were, were having to accept people from hospital without having test, been tested in the past. Um, we were pressing for pre-admission testing to be done. Now, obviously, um, it's too late to apply that ret retrospectively. So the COVID um, is already in care homes and then we can't you know, go back in time for that. But really, the, the, the priority now is that anyone coming into a care home must have a uh, pre-admission test, uh, must be tested negative. Um, and I mean, that, that's the priority. But again, it goes back to my previous statement that, um, again, that, that's not guaranteed because, you know, um, people may develop um, the, the, the virus within, you know, a number of days after that. And again, that gets back to the scientific and the medical evidence needed to support how effective the, the testing is. Okay, thank you. Uh, in relation to the Safe Home project, is it a concern for you that the sector, that, that the unions, and that there are concerns around uh, working conditions and around... Um, union representation within the sector. Is that an issue that, that has kind of been a barrier to partnership working or is it an issue that, that your sector are looking at? Uh, it's an issue that um, the, the Safe at Home project actually was suggested by um, the independent, uh, a care home provider in the independent sector. Um, so that was suggested. It was piloted in conjunction with the department. But um, there were concerns, and I think there was some work in relation to get the union agreement on it, and uh, that, that didn't happen. So the department has now decided um, that it was a worthwhile consideration, but um, obviously it needs to go out now to have a full, you know, full voluntary workforce. Now, how that that's been managed, it, you know, is going to be very difficult. Um, obviously, you need additional staff. The staff need to consent um, and agree to actually live in. And I'm, I'm aware of it happening in, in other locations and other areas in, in England. Um, but it's one that um, obviously needs needs to have full consideration and full agreement of, of all of the staff. I, I think it will be a challenge to, to get to get put in place. Okay, thank you. And, and finally then for me, in terms of communication, and I know I heard you uh, in an interview earlier in the week where some of the announcements had been made in kind of publicly at the same time as they were communicated to care home staff and you have mentioned in your presentation the difficulty that creates with with the public asking care home care home owners what the, what the situation is and them not knowing so what would you suggest in terms of improving those communications how would you suggest those could be or should be improved i think the issue is that um we're all trying very very um you know, very much to, to sort of communicate things out and get ahead of, of these issues. Um, press releases, I know that there's a lot of good work being done on the department in, in relation to try and address some of these. Um, the, the problem is that some press releases have come to me maybe, at, you know, at the same time as going to the press, which doesn't give me time to sort of um, consider or for care homes to be engaged in what those proposals may be. I think the last one was unfortunate that it didn't come to me at all. Um, so that may have just been a blip. Um, I, I do think that there's merit in actually engaging with care home owners earlier in actually looking at possible solutions because, I mean, those people working on the ground actually know whether things work or not. Um, so I think it's maybe more, and the Minister has said, and I fully accept, um, about um, equal partnership, um, but I think we need to get that equal partnership in you know, working in relation to de developing and looking at solutions. Um, together, as well as um, looking at them after the decision has made, been, been made within the department. Okay, thank you. So I'm then going to come to members' questions there, and I'm starting with Colin McGrath. 
Uh, thank you very much, and thank you, Pauline, for your presentation. Um, I wasn't on the committee whenever you last presented, but um, I was able to read the Hansard and, and listen to the updates today, so thank you for that. Um, I just wanted to ask you about, um, I suppose, ultimately, do you feel that the care home sector was left behind? Um, I know that there's been a lot of um, catching up that's been done throughout this process, and, and I typify that by during our process as MLAs, it felt that every week there was a different priority. It went from PPE, it went to testing, it went to care homes. And it just feels that the, the proper emphasis wasn't placed on the care home sector, yet the knowledge was there that the care home sector from places like Spain and Italy was the place that was going to be impacted. Um, the evidence was there at, at four or five weeks ahead of us. And I mean, you mentioned there that on the 17th of March you were given a directive that the PPE wasn't required and at, at, at a certain level and then in the middle of April it was. I mean, do you feel that time in that month where PPE wasn't a priority that that has led to people dying? Uh, well, the first point to the, the question um, in relation to um, the, you know, with, with care homes being left behind, um, I think all of the, the, the independent reports that have been done in the last number of years um, on, the, on behalf of the department have indicated that the social care sector in general is sort of thought of, you know, laterally and that the focus has been on very much on hospitals and the acute care. So all of those reports that were done um, indicated that social care needs to be um, you know, brought into to equal partnership. Um, so, yes, I do think that um, in this pandemic, Quite rightly, I mean, that the priority um, at, at the time was thought to be within the acute services because of the estim estimation of the, the, the number of people that were going to be impacted. I do feel that um, there was a proactive plan in place for acute care, whereas in social care it has been reactive. Now, that doesn't, I don't know whether that, that would trans translate into things not being done on time. I, I don't know. Um, but I do think there was a lot of work and a lot of effort put into the acute care um, because that was deemed to be where a, a lot of the pandemic um, would present. Um, so, yes, I think it has been reactive. In relation to left behind in the PPE, yes, I do believe we, that we, we did have to, um, you know, struggle and, and argue about PPE early on. Now, um, as to whether that has led to any adverse impact on residents, I, I don't know. I, I don't know the answer to that. Um, that would be one that would obviously have to be picked up at a later stage. Um, I, early on, I mean, there wasn't, um, a, well, there didn't appear to be the virus in care homes. And at that time when we thought that it was going to be present, uh, that was the time when we picked up and actually said about the, the relevant PPE. Early on in the process, we were told that um, it, it was just normal infection control processes that were needed and that you were only really needing PPE when people were symptomatic. And it was really only later on um, then the guidance came out that obviously asymptomatic people um, you know, could, could carry the virus as well. So I suppose it's one of those... You know, people made the decisions based on the best evidence that they had. Yeah, and I mean, I think, um, Pauline, we're, we're, we're sitting currently on, I think, a ticking time bomb, which may take a month, six months or a year. But when the full story comes out about our care home sector and the way that they were left behind, I think there's going to be a lot of lessons that need to be learned. And, and we need to be asking people like the permanent secretary, who's been in charge for the last number of years, uh, in the department, maybe more so than the minister that's only been there for a few weeks. But I think we'll come to that inquiry uh, at some point. Can I ask, do you feel that the um, organisations such as the RQIA providing a telephone service has been of much use to your sector? Um, and so you know, they, they stopped as a, a directive from the chief medical officer, stopped their home visits on the 20th of March, uh, potentially for a, a matter of up to six to eight weeks, there was only one or two um, visits that took place. Now, I know probably a lot within your sector probably don't want RQIA anywhere near the door, but do you feel that the support and guidance that they could uh, have offered um, with their visits uh, could have assisted and that them simply being reprofiled to a telephone service was, was of much use? Well, I mean, I think very early on the RQIA were um, keen to provide whatever assistance that was of you know, most of benefit. 
at the early on in this, there was an awful lot of questions. I mean, the, the, the sector was coming to me asking me questions. I was putting the questions to the department, to the RQIA. We were all, you know, looking at this and saying, look, you know, we need guidance, we need help, we need instructions in this. So the RQIA, I believe, did position themselves to be able to provide that um, help and that um, telephone um, contact. Um, they were also a source of information coming from um, care homes um, to work with the PHA, and I know they have um, joined up with the PHA to share that information. So uh, at the time, they were also we were looking, looking to reduce the footfall into care homes um, and actually reduce obviously the the impact of um, some someone coming in, possibly moving from care home to care home, doing inspections and carrying the virus with them. Um, so th I think they, they did position themselves um, as best they could to provide assistance. Um, during that time, as the, the virus developed and as it progressed, um, you know, there was the issue about, well, you know, would it be of benefit, to, particularly when we, I was saying about needing staff resources? You know, could it have been that, um, you know, uh, inspectors who are highly, highly qualified and highly skilled in how care homes operate, and nurses that are employed by RQIA, that they possibly could have been redeployed to provide additional, you know, resource on the ground. But again, all of those had to be balanced with what are the risks of actually, you know, more people arriving. And, and we all knew that the virus only moved with people. So um, I, I think the RQIA have done the best that they can in the circumstances. Yeah, that's a good, robust support for the RQIA, and it's novel, so I welcome it. Um, finally, can I say just that given that um, the, the sector has had resources cut, pay is low, and conditions can be tough, and you really have to rely on the staff, on their vocation, do you, would you welcome a full review at the end of this to see how we can better value and better, better support the staff uh, and the whole cultures within our care home sectors? Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, I have been uh, making the same case um, each year. I go, I do a, a, an update, a presentation to the Health and Social Care Board. I raise all of those things in relation to the challenges about um, recruiting and retaining staff. Um, we've made proposals in relation to career paths um, and saying that we need, to, we need to value the people in care homes and in home care because um, I'm not sure that the complexity of the care that they deliver is fully understood. Um, by um, the public and by you know wider society, so I, I unfortunately have taken a pandemic to, to maybe you know raise that that profile. But I do think there is a lot of work to be done to actually properly recognise people that work in this sector. And you only have to listen to the news earlier this week where there are questions in relation to which, which actually I, I was quite surprised by that people were asking about well well you know can nursing homes actually deal with end of life or deal with people having COVID at end of life. And nursing homes um, are, as um, Dr McBride said yesterday, they're, they're very um, complex um, environments where there are very challenging um, you know, situations to be dealt with and um, experienced nurses there to actually manage, manage those issues. Thank, thank you. And, uh uh, could I just, uh, well, I'm, I'm going to go now to Jerry, Paula, Pam, then I'll go to the members on the phone. And if I could just, uh, I did give Colin a little bit of indulgence there in, as he had waived his, uh, his, his question in the last session, given the pressure of time. But if I just remind members, one or maximum two questions, please, so we can get around everyone. So, Jerry, go ahead, please. Uh, thanks, Chair. Uh, thanks, Pauline. Uh, and I want to obviously pay tribute to the workers in the care sector who are doing incredible work under very stressful and, and challenging uh, circumstances. And I would urge all of them, uh, if they aren't already, to, to join a union. And I know there's there's some obstacles presented by some care home owners in that regard, but I think it's very important that they protect themselves and, and the, the, the patients and, and people in the homes by, by joining the union. Uh, two quick questions. Um, Pauline, would you agree with Eddie Kerr of the Hutchinson Homes Group, who publicly said that he was uh, frustrated and it was a struggle at the start of this pandemic. Uh, and Anne McCracken from Mastery Manor, um, who was critical of the information being passed to car homes and indicated that she had to follow what was happening in Italy and Spain uh, in order to catch up. Uh, and also in regards to uh, the owners of car homes, 
um, has it been the case that they've been buying their own PPE uh, or have they all been coming from uh, the department uh, or the NHS? Uh, and in regards to um, SSP, I'm very concerned that uh, staff who are working in, in care homes are only getting uh, Saturday sick pay when they're uh, unwell. Um, so do you know um, how many care homes uh, are only paying um, Saturday sick pay? Thanks. Thank you, Jerry. Um, Pauline, over to you. Okay, um, on the issue uh, uh, on agreement with Eddie Kerr and um, his um, statement in relation to the frustration, yes, um, I do agree. Um, the frustration at the beginning of this, and it probably shows in um, my last um, uh, briefing to the Health Committee, I mean, the frustration at that point was considerable. Um, there was a lot of um, communication, there was a lot of concern, a lot of fear, um, and a lot of um, probably panic. And it took a long time to get that stabilised. So, yes, I agree that there were concerns um, and frustrations at the very start. There was concerns around the guidance. We went from having no guidance to having, um, you know, bucket loads of guidance that we had to try and wade our, wade our way through. So that was all very difficult. Um, so, yes, I do agree with that statement. On the owners um, of care homes buying their own PPE, um, yeah, I think it's a mix. I, I think the, the department or the trusts have really stepped up under providing PPE, under replenishing the PPE. At the start, um, there was a lot of um, PPE purchased by um, you know, own, their own, own providers. Um, IHCP, us as an organisation, we purchased as well um, because we knew that um, providers couldn't get it, so we had purchased on behalf of providers. So there's been a mixed approach, but at the minute, I believe that it, it is largely being provided by, um, the, by the trusts. On the statutory sick pay, I'm very conscious of the fact that um, there, there is an issue around um, SSP and um, people haven't managed to, to live on SSP. We have resolved the, the, that issue with the department in relation to home care services and um, they have now um, uh, agreed that they will um, fund the gap um, and that will be um, put through, I, I think it may already have been arranged through the home care services and um, the department is currently looking at our uh, proposal because we're saying that it also needs to be rectified for staff within um, care homes. So that is under active consideration. Thank you, Pauline. Paula. Um, thank you, and thank you for all your work um, you've been doing over the last few weeks. It's been amazing. Um, two, two very quick questions. Um, the NISRA statistics that come out on a Friday, they show that 50% of, of COVID-related deaths are in hospital, 45% are in care homes. What is your understanding of that breakdown within hospitals in terms of the number who were in care homes, but because of clinical decision-making, they were transferred to hospital for treatment and then unfortunately lost their life. So I'm just wondering that 50% figure, because we know that 66% of deaths are amongst the 80 year plus. And the uh, second... unfor... Sorry, go ahead. Uh, sorry, Paula. Unfortunately, I, I don't have that information. Um, and I suppose it gets back to the fact of us being a membership organisation and, and really, you know, I don't uh, collect data as such and I don't collect that from uh, care homes. Um, but initially, well, I don't, um, not everyone is a member of IHCP, so it wouldn't be complete in any event. So I'm not sure that I can actually answer your, quest your question, Paula. I'm sorry. No problem, thank you. But the second one is in relation to the funding that the Minister announced, I think it was £6.5 million pounds extra for care homes. Has that money reached the care homes? And if so, uh, is, is there more to come, or should should there be more to come? The, the six point, um, um, you're cutting out a wee bit, Paula, but I think the question was around has the funding of the six point five million got to the care homes yet? Yes. My understanding is yes, but it, um, it would have went through into accounts. I think possibly last Friday or the Friday before, if my memory serves me right. Um, so I do believe that money has been allocated. Um, IHCP has a proposal currently with the department um, in relation to the additional cost of COVID for care homes and we have put in other proposals now at the minute. The department have, have, have advised us that um, well really you know, our proposals can't be seen as independent and uh, this, this has always been a concern but um, you know, I've always said look we're very happy to end up, get some independent um, review of um, the, you know, the additional costs, um, but I know that the department are considering um, additional funding. What shape that is, or what it looks like, I haven't been involved in any of those discussions. Okay, thank you. Uh, sorry, I should have declared an interest of a family member working in a care home. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, 
Thank you, Chair, and thank you, Pauline, again for your attendance at the committee. It's been uh, always very useful to hear what's um, happening on the ground in terms of the um, independent sector. There, um, I wanted to ask you, Pauline, in terms of the Safe at Home project, um, and especially going forward now into the future. And uh, we know how uncertain it is. We know that that uh, COVID-19 is not going to disappear anytime soon. So those threats are going to be continuous and always be there. And you had also mentioned um, the impact of the restrictions on on uh, residents. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm only picking up there, there's some difficulty maybe with me hearing all of the all of the questions. But I think was it in relation relation to safe at home? Yeah, I'll try again. Can you hear me better now, Pauline? Yes, uh-huh. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, so in relation to safe at home in particular, and you had raised um, the the impact of the restrictions on uh, residents, and we were very aware that uh, many homes have a lot of dementia patients, for example. Um, so I suppose there's two parts to my question. One is around uh, what what do you believe? I mean, I think it's disappointing that the unions haven't been able to support the safe at home. Um, project, uh, I think it's uh, something going forward that needs to happen in order to, to maintain safety, to, to uh, take away as much movement in and out of the care homes as possible. But what, uh, in your view, are the barriers for the union supporting that project? And the second part of that question is in around um, your comments of the impact of the restrictions on residents. And what more can the independent sector do in conjunction with the department to ensure that there are measures introduced into care homes, such as um, you know, limited protected uh, visiting, uh, screens, partitions, whatever we need in order to actually uh, support the, you know, not just the physical but the mental health of, of the residents in those care homes? Okay. Sorry, I, I, I'm picking up some of, some of that question, so sorry if I'm only answering part of it. It's just that the signal's coming and going, so I'm only picking up snippets from, unfortunately. Um, in relation to the safe at home um, and the, you know, the issue about um, you know, challenges within that, um, obviously we need to find some method of moving forward. I mean, if this pandemic and this virus is going to be with us for some time, um, as you know, the community gets frustrated and needs to have some relaxation of lockdown, obviously there needs to be some consideration of people visiting and people getting to see their loved ones in care homes. So you know, that, that does need to be a priority of say, how can we do this? We'll never be able to do it and, and eliminate the risk, but how can we do it and actually balance the risk? And um, you know, mitigate mitigate against it, and that might be you know some care homes have had the likes of um, drive drive through visits. Um, they've had um, you know maybe um, I you know views of um, you know it, well particularly end of life care um, or at, at the end of life some care homes have actually you know kitted up and trained um, a family member in PPE and, and how to be safe so they can spend some time with, with their loved one. So there's lots of methods and arrangements that could be put in place. Maybe the likes of um, a, a staff member being allocated to a, mem- a family member to actually brief them and make sure that they do not breach any of the, you know, the, the virus you know, risks and things. So there's, there's things that I think we need to be innovative about and actually um, you know, come up with, but all on the basis that families must accept that there will be a risk with this. And that might be that families have to say, well, yes, we accept that we're, we're taking a risk here, but that's balanced against the need to actually see the person in, you know, they love, and, that, and that's the way it'll be. Appreciate I'm not sure if I've answered your full, your full question, because I'm not sure that I heard the, the complete question, on, unfortunately. It answers part, Pauline. Um, I, would, I would still be concerned um, with what, uh, in terms of the Safe at Home project, what the union's uh, concerns are that would stop that progressing. Um, further. Oh right, okay. I, to be honest, I'm not. I haven't been privy to that. Um, all of that was managed between the department and the unions. Mm-hmm. Our only input from the independent sector was that a provider had put forward a proposal and had suggested that this might be a way forward. Um, and the department worked with that um, provider and with the unions. But I can't answer your question about barriers. Um, I'm not sure what what they they were. Okay, thank you. Okay. 
Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm going now across to the phones, so I'm going in the same order the last time. Orlea, are you there? Yes. Yep. Um, thank you, Chair. I could just come back to the, um, I know that Paula has touched on just around um, the stabilising payments for car homes and the additional grants. And I was just wondering, Pauline, um, do you know what the uptake has been um, in any of these grants? And do car homes have any input um, in the, you know, like designing the criteria um, of how you could apply? Um, okay, Orlea. Um, th th actually, there, there weren't grants as such, and there wasn't really an application process. My understanding was that the department had um, allocated 6.5 million, and they had allocated on the basis of I think the criteria was the size of the number of beds in the care home. So they'd split it, I think, between 10, um, 10,000, 15,000, and 20,000 were the payments, and those were automatic payments that were going to be paid to the care home of of those. You know, determined by the, the, that size, the payments have come through, and they've asked the care homes to keep receipts for all of the expenditure because they will be monitoring the expenditure. That's my understanding of how it's worked. So it wasn't a matter of, of care homes having to apply; they were automatically issued the, the, the payments. Okay, thank, thank you, Pauline. You. Or okay. Leah, yeah, are you okay there, Leah? Is that have you a second question? Yes, um, thank you. I actually did just quickly see you had mentioned earlier on around the testing, um, and obviously, as that's been increased within the car homes, have any? I know you're waiting on more information from, from the department, but see the conversations around you know consent of testing the residents. Has any of those conversations begun to happen with residents of their families, Pauline? Uh, I'm not. I'm not aware or lay of the up to date position in that. Um, I know that. Um, uh, obviously, the majority of families and the majority of people in care homes will consent to it. I think the issue arises in the human rights where you have someone with dementia who um, does not necessarily understand or someone with learning disabilities that does not understand about the, about the test, which can be quite intrusive and unpleasant. Um, but I haven't heard any, I actually haven't heard of any um, providers coming back and saying they have had people refuse this. Um, but um, it, it will be. A pro I think it will raise its head going forward. Thank you. Thank Pauline. you. Okay. Okay, Orlea. Thank you, Pauline and Orlea. And coming now to Alex Easton. Are you there, Alex? Do we have Alex on the line? I'll move on to Pat, and I'll check back with Alex in a minute. Pat Sheehan, are you on the line there? No. Okay, I'll go across now to Alan, and then we'll, take, we'll check back on the phones before we close. Uh, we'll thank you, Chair. Uh, Pauline, you have sort of uh, answered my question there. The, uh, the, uh, the, the uh, Minister did uh, announce that uh, there was going to be this uh, programme of uh, testing uh, throughout the, uh, the nursing and care home sector, and Chief Medical Officer, he hasn't been able to confirm uh, if it's going to be a one-off or whether it's going to become uh, necessary to make it a routine, regular feature uh, going forward. But in relation to uh, seeking uh, permission uh, from the next of kin for those uh, residents of uh, care homes and nursing homes that maybe can't make that decision themselves, you say that the feedback at the moment has been that uh, nobody has uh, indicated that they're going to refuse. Uh, but I would presume that uh, the, the homes themselves, uh, the authority to uh, allow the testing to be carried out, uh, is that actually delegated uh, to the management of the home, uh, or do the next of kin uh, all have the individual right, uh, or, uh, not, not to actually refuse, but to actually give permission? So is it a proactive exercise? Do you have to go to the next of kin and ask them directly to give permission, or will it be a case of you'll go ahead and do it unless the next of kin actually come to you and say, no, I don't want the test carried out? I don't think I can answer your question, Alan. I don't think of the information, and I think it's some of the questions that we're actually asking in relation to the rule out of the testing. Um, uh, whilst there's a statement to say that testing will be applied to all care home residents and all staff, those are the questions we're saying in terms of that policy. What does that actually mean? It, if someone does refuse or a family member refuses, does that mean then that that person will have to be isolated completely within um, a care home? 
um, you know, until there's, uh, until there's, um, you know, a, 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 you know, some way of controlling the virus or, um, you know, an antidote or something or other for it. Um, so I, I'm not sure that it can answer the question. And it's probably one for the, well, for human rights or for, for the medical profession to actually say, well, what do you do if someone refuses? And if it's in their best interests, how do you actually manage that? So I'm sorry, Alan, I can't give you a direct answer. Well, Molly, just in, in terms of, of if a child goes to school, you put the child into the care of the school authorities and they can make decisions around the child's health while the child is in their care. But equally, while a, a patient, uh, particularly, say, a dementia patient is in, in the home, um, it, do you, does the provider have to seek permission from the next of kin for every action that they take in relation to that patient? Or do they have, uh, as I said earlier, some sort of delegated authority that they can act in what they consider to be the best interests at that particular time of the patient? Well, that, that would be under the regulations in terms of the, the departmental regulations as to, you know, they're all you know, highly regulated in terms of, um, you know, sort of what, what can be done, what can't be done, and those then will be monitored by the RQIA. Um, so... I, I'm not sure that I could answer in detail as to what exactly might happen if you know if someone has dementia. I would have thought, and this is only my my own thought, is that um, the the um, next of kin who's allocated as next of kin has the right to communicate on behalf of the person. But again, um, I'm not. I, I wouldn't be confident of that actually confirming that. Thank you. Thank you, Pauline. Um, checking back on the phone lines now, do we have contact with Alex at the moment on the phone? Alex, are you there? No, I don't think so. And I'm also checking for Pat. Pat Sheehan, are you on the phone there at present? Yes, I'm here, Colin. Pat, your question, please. Okay, thanks. Uh, thanks for your presentation, Pauline. Uh, I mean, the safe at home model has some merit. There's no doubt about that, but there, there are also many problems with it and too many to go into here now. But um, some care homes that I'm aware of have, uh, for instance, they've cancelled annual leave. They haven't brought in agency staff, uh, and that's not sustainable in the long term. So in terms of preventing infection being brought into the homes, what can be done to prevent for example, agency staff unwittingly bringing the virus from uh, one care home to another. And my second question, just a short one, is why can care homes, particularly nursing homes, not do their own testing as opposed to having uh, teams coming out and doing that testing for them? Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Pat. On, on the first question, say what the model um, and about the cancelling annual leave and not bringing in agency staff. Um, I suppose um, I said in the last presentation um, to the, the committee about the fact that um, the, the sector, the care home sector and home care sector, were not going into this pandemic in a, in a very, good, you know, very good place. We've been flagging up in terms of staff shortages, in terms of nurse shortages. So it was a fragile sector in the first place and to add a pandemic onto it obviously adds even um, more challenges. Um, in relation to bringing in agency staff and transferring the, the only and um, transferring of the virus, the um, procedures would be followed in terms of that um, checklist, in terms of um, checking temperature and um, going through a checklist um, for staff as they arrive for their shift um, each, day, each day and there's also um, processes in place in relation to um, their, you know, their um, uniform. Um, so the, those normal processes would be followed. But as has already been mentioned, we're never going to eliminate this completely, no matter what um, you know, sort of checks are put in place. Yeah, I suppose, um, Pauline, sorry, sorry to interrupt you. I, I suppose I'm thinking, you know, in terms of staff who may be moving about a, a, a number of care homes, and would it be possible to have a system in place, for example, if one person was going to, to move from one home to another, that 48 hours beforehand they would get a, a test to ensure that they weren't carrying the virus, something along those lines? 
Well, that, that might be possible. Um, the, I suppose the issue is that you know, we're also getting staff transferred over from trust to help out. And it's uh, probably that, you know, making arrangements that we're trying to minimise the number of people um, and trying to keep some consistency in the staff. Um, but yes, um, that, that gets back, I suppose, to the question about, well, how, how long um, does a test, is, is it valid for? You know, is it, you know, two days, is it three days? Um, how long do you wait for a test to come back? Um, and those are all the questions that are, I suppose, the ones that need to be answered um, under the, the rollout programme. Yeah. Um, okay. the, the, part, the, the second question, uh, I took a note, but I can't read my writing now. <laughs> what was the second question? Because, wh wh why can care homes, particularly nursing homes, not do their own testing? You know, why can test yes. kits not mm -hmm. be left at the front door to, to, to uh, care home take them in and does the testing themselves? Perhaps there's actually been a mixed approach to that. Um, and some trusts have um, provided um, staff, nurses to come in and actually do the testing in care homes. Some have provided um, online training for nurses that are actually in care homes. Um, and so there has been a mixed approach to it. So some, some of them actually um, rely on nurses coming in from trusts and others. The nurses actually do the tests in their own, in their own care home. So that's mixed. We like, obviously, we'd like it now to be further supported with the, the Northern Ireland Ambulance Service and those 40 nurses that have been allocated to roll out the testing. So, yes, nurses and care homes have been doing it. Thank, thank you, it not, Colin. Not thank you, Colin. Uh, OK, Pat, that's, you know, we're moving on there, Pat. No. Uh, thank you very much, Pauline. Um, we really appreciate your briefing today. I have to say that uh, it's a sector that we have a uh, considerable concern around and, and we are hoping to have a number of briefings in the weeks ahead from other perspectives on, on the care home setting and it's one we're very keeping keeping a close eye on in terms of the difficulties there. So thank you for that and uh, we we'll, uh, we thank look you. forward to talking to you again. Okay, thank you Pauline. Thank you. Okay, Thanks. bye. Okay members, moving on now to item seven there of our agenda. Uh, SR 2020 forward slash 82, the Health Protection Coronavirus Restrictions Amendments. Can I advise members that the Department has made a statutory rule to amend the Health Protection Coronavirus Restrictions Regulations 2020, which provide for the first steps in easing lockdown restrictions? The SR was made under the Emergency Procedure of the Public Health Act 1967 and came into operation on the 15th of May. This item, members, was therefore added to the agenda at short notice, and there has not been time to coordinate with officials from the Department in relation to a briefing. So are members content that we defer this item in order to arrange a briefing? Yes, please. Yeah. Okay. Members content. Please. Thank you. Uh, correspondence, then, turning to correspondence, I refer members to uh, tab 8 of your pack and table papers and to the correspondence memo, memo at tab 8.1. So I'd like to draw members' attention just to several items. Item 8.4 is a copy of a departmental response to the issues raised by the Royal College of Speech and Language Therapists regarding the provision of PPE for dysphasia assessments. Item 8.5 is further correspondence from the Royal College expressing its disappointment with the department's response to its concerns. Are members content to note for now, given the Chief Medical Officer's commitment yesterday at committee to come to a view within a week? Members content to that? Okay. Yeah, no. Thank you. Yeah, Chair, just to say Sorry. a welcome that, that the answer we got yesterday, and um, we certainly can go back and look at that within, he said, days, a week. Uh, so hopefully that um, will be looked at in the very near future, I think, as a great concern. So. Yeah, we'll on that, so I would happy to note it for now. Okay, thank, thank you, Pam. Okay, moving on to item 8.6, which is the 10th report of the Examiner of Statutory Rules. Can I remind members that the committee considered SR 2020 forward slash 71, the Health Protection Coronavirus Restrictions Amendment Regulations NA 2020, at its meeting on 30th of April, and agreed it had no objection to the rule, subject to the Examiner of Statutory Rules report. The Examiner has now made her report and has no comments to make on this ASR. So are members content to note the Examiner of Statutory Rules report? Yes. Content. Thank you, members. Item 8.7 is a co copy of correspondence from the Committee for Communities to the Department of Health regarding a briefing from Solace 
The Committee for Communities is encouraging the development of a cross-departmental strategic approach to support councils. Um, do members have any comments on that or anything that they wish to raise? And if not, are members content to wish to write a letter of support in relation to that project? Yeah, members content. Thank you. Item 8.8 .8 is a correspondence from Ms Martina Anderson, MLA, seeking the committee's support for her request to the Department for an uplift in payments to those affected by the contaminated blood issue. And this is a, an issue, a, a, a matter that the committee had significant dealings with uh, in advance of the previous end of f financial year. So any comments in relation to that issue that members want to raise? I think, Chair, it would, it would, just, it would be good to get an update from the Department where we are with the whole issue and, and if there are you know, find out what those issues are going forward in terms of yeah. dealing with those. I, I would agree. I think I think a, a briefing, a, a briefing from a written briefing from the part and updating the committee on, yeah, on that. Yeah, very useful. Members content with that approach? Mm -hmm. Yep. Thank you, members. So remaining items uh, then in terms of the are members content otherwise with the actions as noted in the correspondence memo? Yep. Yep. Members content. So there are two items then of correspondence in table papers. Item 8.12 is the update we requested from the Independent Neurology Inquiry a couple of weeks ago, advising that their work is ongoing, but that a number of witness evidence sessions have to, have to, had to be rescheduled due to the pandemic. So any comment on that? Are members content to note for now? Did get the update. Yeah. Okay. Members content to note. Thank you. Item 8.13 is a reply from the Minister to our letter calling for longer-term financial support for the community and voluntary sector, advising of the steps being taken to support the sector. The Minister refers to the executive announcement of a £22 million funding scheme and advises that a public announcement will be made shortly about funding arrangements and the application process. Um, any comment on that? Are members content to note? Yep. Members content to note. Thank you. Forward work then. Can I refer members to the draft forward work programme at tab 9.1 of the pack? Are members content to note the forward work programme? Content. Um, Thank you. Chair, just, uh, well, I wasn't sure it was under AOB or the forward work programme, but I just think on the back of the Safe at Home uh, project in particular, I think it would be really good to have to invite the unions either to um, provide us with a brief in writing or to have them here. Um, to tell us what the issues are, because I think the Safe at Home uh, project really it needs to be looked at. I think it would be um, some way part of a solution to dealing with the care home issue and uh, cutting down on the amount of in and out from those homes to avoid transmission of, of COVID. Yeah, and, and uh, I think that I, when I was referring there to the future uh, sessions that we have, unions are actually penciled in at this stage to, for the 11th of June, so I think that would be timely, and that would be a good opportunity for them to express their their concerns and views and, and suggestions. Yeah, Paula? Yeah, thank you, Chair. Uh, just uh, off the back of this morning, we had those great presentations from the addiction societies. <coughs> I'm conscious that next week, um, the second one around stakeholder, there's, there's three or four to come in. If we can just make sure there's plenty of time, because I think there was a lot of issues there that, that probably could have even drilled further down to as well. Yeah. But I know next Thursday is going to be a very long day, but just to give give them the, the, their space to, to tell us their issues. Okay, thank you. Um, can I further refer members then? So members are content to note with the, with those with those uh, remarks, and may I further refer members to the memo at nine point two in relation to a further international panel. Any suggestions or comments in relation to that? Do members? Um, so the idea would be that we, we draw in expertise from from international experience. So members are members content to approve the list of those to be invited? There's a list, I think. Can we email in suggestions, sure? If we if we have any people, I mean they may not be available, but it might be an idea to email in suggestions. Yeah, and I suppose provided they fit within the criteria that has been that has been set out. Yeah, and I think that's open to all members. You know all members if, if they want to make suggestions but I suppose we do need to have a criteria to uh, allow the, the panel to prepare in, in a sense as to what it is we're after. Uh, Claire? Um, just to say I think looking at our forward work programme it looks like the first available slot would be the 25th of June for that and um, so um, you would want to get your invitations out relatively soon and there would be a maximum number you would want to invite as a first wave you know you, uh, I'd imagine the committee 
might be prepared to agree a panel of three or four is manageable. When it gets beyond that, it's probably getting difficult. So it's a question of the committee agreeing its priority yeah. invitation list. And so I would need to bring it back next week then to the committee to um, come to a decision. I'll include anything, any other names that are supplied to me. And then um, the committee can make a final decision on the top number of uh, invitations to send, if that's okay. And it, it's not it's not a, a cut off point either, and that I think this would that will be a useful thing, given given how new all of this is and how much learning there clearly is and is going to be. I think that will be something that we would benefit from at a different occasion. So I think if people don't make it onto the list at this time, they can possibly at a future date. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, the we we invited a, a panel of experts last week, and and uh, two of them were from served on the independent CH group. Um, so you, you are, uh, and there's nothing wrong, I suppose, with seeking alternative views. Um, but I, I, I'm just wondering, w w really, I, I would like to hear from the people who are actually driving this, not from the people who would maybe like to be driving it or who are backseat drivers. I'd like to actually hear from the drivers. And, and the people who are driving this from a scientific perspective are the actual uh, SAGE committee uh, that serves uh, and, and it's responsible to the government. Uh, and I would like to see maybe a panel of speakers who are serving on that SAGE come along and, and uh, justify uh, the, the course of action that they are taking, rather than constantly hearing from people who have an alternative view, who don't agree with what the SAGE committee is doing, so, you know, could we maybe look at the, those who serve on the CH committee and, uh, and invite a panel from them to come along some week? Well, I suppose the first difficulty there arises from the fact that the CH membership is, is secret. Um, I also think that the people who are driving are clearly in the driving seat. And if you want to provide other perspectives um, or other, other ways of looking. And, and, and I also think that even SAGE and that, you know, as this has developed, have, have recognised that some of the things that have been raised are good ideas. So I think any responsible organisation is always open to uh, alternative voices or challenges yeah, or whatever. But also, our, our role is uh, to hold people to account. And the people that we need to hold to account are not the people who have alternative views. The people that we need to hold to account are the people who are moulding the tactics and the way forward, those are the people that we're uh, going to hold them to account. That's who we need to be holding the to account. And I'm not so sure, uh, Chair, that it is a secret committee. I think that members of it have the right uh, to remain anonymous, but I think it's in the public domain. Don't ask me who they are, but uh, it is in the public domain that there are a, a number of names uh, that uh, that uh, are, are out there and are quite happy to uh, allow themselves to be identified with it. But I well, think it's something that we should at least, I'm only asking for you to at least look at it. You know? Absolutely. And actually, we have requested that, that our own chief scientific officer would, would brief the committee. I think that would be useful as you know, well. So, so that's, yeah. that's, that's already in place. Um, there's I also overlap. Think I think that's critical because I'm getting now quite a number of constituents come and saying, this, we keep getting this answer, the scientific research says we can, the scientific research says we can't, but nobody knows what the scientific is, the research is, and, and I'm wondering, am I missing it? Is it published somewhere and we're not saying it? And, um, but it would certainly to measure that against them, what the alternative panel would be saying, because they would be saying, well, X, Y, and Z is wrong. We would suggest A, B, and C, but we could do that comparative in our head if we were to get that sort of knowledge. Yeah. A, and, and, that. yeah, no, so we, we've, asked, we've asked the CSO for the 3rd of June, so we're hoping for that. In relation to your other point, Alan, we, we do have a scrutiny role, and those are the people who are accountable. We also have an advisory role, and I think to play a constructive advisory part, it's useful to hear a range of voices. So mm -hmm. you, that, that's noted. I think there is broad agreement that, that we should, yeah. we should uh, go ahead with, with uh, suggestions on a, for an additional panel based on. So, okay, content with that, members, to proceed. I'm going then to any other business. Do members have any other business today? Yeah. I, 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 I'm, I'm at indicated. I'm maybe yes. indicated. Yeah. Thank you. Um, just um, briefly on the um, the unions coming to bid. Could we could we act, could we say to them that we would like specifically a briefing in particular on the safe at home 
issue so that they're well prepared for that. And the other thing was the, the addiction services um, briefings were very, very useful earlier, but I think there's there's a few things coming out of that that we could maybe tease out with the department or maybe ask a few questions which might not necessarily belong to the Department of Health, but then in turn could go to other departments, and that's in around um, the, the testing issue, uh, which is happening in Wales, and asking, you know, is there a, an, an NI solution? And, and we heard from uh, the, the panel that, that it's a very expensive system, and, and I think there was talk about, you know, even the purchase of testing slots that might actually solve that issue. So I think we should delve down a bit deeper. So if we could write the department and ask a few specific questions around that. And also um, was mentioned the lack of digital capacity and broadband. And we know that's an issue uh, across the board. And I think it would be right to, to raise it again in this context of the addiction issues, because given that um, all those services are going to heavily rely on technology, uh, for the foreseeable future and probably for all of time. I think it's even more important to raise that and, and see where we are with that and make sure it's getting high priority. Um, and uh, also uh, the issue of the gambling in terms of addiction, the uh, online gambling and the apps. And I, I know probably everybody in this assembly is, is uh, supportive of, of dealing with that very serious issue, but I think we should ask the department um, uh, for an update on on where we are with that, on, on, on potential limitation of these type of advertisements or indeed banning of them. Yeah, um, and the other issue would be PP provision for those addiction services. Yeah. And if I could just add to the issue on testing, which I think is, is a concern, I think uh, we should explore also if on the island of Ireland is the capacity for, for that is multi-spectral test or whatever that was referred to. I just want to check, do we have members on the phone still? And I'm coming to you, Alan. I'm, I'm, I just want to check: Are we still core? Uh, yes, sure. Yes, we have Arlie on the phone. So, Alan. Uh, yes, sure. It's just uh, in relation to this uh, question I'm that I've been asked. Thank you, Pat. Sorry. Yeah. Just in relation to this question, I've been asking about um, the consent uh, been given for uh, residents of nursing homes and care homes uh, to actually undergo this test, which everybody agrees is invasive. It's unpleasant. Um, but nobody seems to be prepared, uh, and, and maybe I can sort of understand to a degree, nobody seems to be uh, given a definitive answer. Everybody seems to be kicking the can down the road a little bit. Uh, and it is going to become an issue in the next two weeks when the, uh, the uh, Department of Health and Public Health Authority roll into the nursing homes to do this. Um, th there's going to have to be, you know, there's going to have to be definitive answers given then. Um, so I, I don't know who uh, uh, is responsible or whether there are uh, actual regulations or whether each home has their own sort of terms of reference and how they, uh, they occur and who is the authority to do certain things uh, in relation to the welfare of, of the, uh, the residents. So I wonder could we maybe uh, write to the, uh, I don't know whether the RQIA might have a role in it, uh, the human rights, we've talked about the human rights. Commission, um, could I maybe propose or suggest that we write to both those organisations and ask for their opinion? I think we need to know it. I don't think we, we as the accountability committee, I don't think we can go forward in the dark. I think we, we need to know, we're entitled to know uh, just where the responsibility, you know, where does the buck stop and where does it end in relation to permission being given for patients to undergo this test, particularly if it's going to be an ongoing thing. I mean, you may get a situation where the next of kin uh, may tolerate it the first time, but if it has to happen on an ongoing basis, they'll not be so happy. And I, I can just, I can imagine, I have had relatives, we all have, uh, suffering from dementia in nursing homes. And I mean, they, they, they would be absolutely, I can imagine the horror and the terror that they would experience of somebody you know, in this full gear coming at them and trying to stick something down their throat, but just not understand what that's about. So, you know, it, yeah. it's a big concern I have, and, and I'd like to, somebody to give me a definitive answer is who, who makes a final call and whether yeah. that, that swab goes down somebody's throat. That, that, no, that, that's a very valid point, I have to say. It's, it's, well, it's welcome that the testing has been wrapped up. Absolutely. That's, that's a particular, Absolutely. We, we, do have, we do have Eddie Lynch, hopefully, appearing at some stage, the Commissioner for Older People, at some stage appearing. So Eddie might have views on that as well. So I think that's... that's well, uh, I think Eddie has been very vocal in, in calling for the test. But again, like everybody, 
I'm wondering, is everybody, uh, you know, are they extending their focus down the road, or are they just thinking about the immediate benefits of doing something without looking at what the unintended consequences are? And it's the unintended consequences that, that worry me. I certainly welcome the, the concept of testing, as I'm sure Eddie does, and he's been calling for it, but it's... it's and I, I would guess Eddie is, is, is alive to that as well. But it is, it is a valid. Yeah. Are members content to be right to both RQAA in terms of the regulations and the Human Rights Commissioner yeah. for his view? Yeah, sure, just uh, briefly to say that... Um, sorry, Pam, just a second. I will come to the members on the phone, by the way. I'm, I'm aware you're there. I'll come to you for AOB in a second, just in case you think I've forgotten. Yeah, um, just on the back of Alan's point, which is very valid. Um, I would imagine that the, the uh, mental capacity is issue is, is what comes into force in, in these cases because obviously that would apply to all kind of, I suppose it's not treatment, it could be more of a preventative thing, but I think it is good to get clarification on the issue and presumably, uh, well I think I'm pretty much sure there, there, there are um, uh, measures within the coronavirus bill actually that would allow kind of enf enforcing of, of testing, I think, if you do debate, I don't think anybody would want to go down that route, but it would be good to get clarification on it, because I think we're all a bit concerned, yeah. uh, because it is a pretty nasty, intrusive test. Um, yeah, thank you. So, members on the phone then, in relation to that, are you broadly content with what you've heard so far? Have you anything you wish to add to that, or indeed any other business? <laughs> I think that's, that's so, who have we got on the phone there at present? You can't give the fingers on the phone, but I think that was just... <laughs> Colin? Yes, or Leah, go ahead. Um, yeah, just to say, I, I, I think it was happening with Pauline earlier on. Sometimes when people are talking, it's cutting out for <clears throat> a good wee bit, so there was oh. parts of that that, that mm -hmm. I couldn't really hear. Um, but yes, content about writing off to the Equality Commission and RQIA, and also um, Pam's point earlier around <clears throat> a letter to um, the department just following up on some of the issues raised from the <coughs> addictions presentations. Um, there's also, I know, a, an a, a addiction subgroup that's being set up. I think it's a collaboration of the PHA, the trust, and the department. So <coughs> it might be an option that we're right off to that wee group as well, just around some of the the, um, the opioid um, substitution and, and the you know resume of services and things like that. So, yep, content. Okay. And just for clarity earlier, the suggestion was the Human Rights Commissioner and RQIA on the on the capacity issue. Oh, yes, thank you. Sorry about that. Thank you. Um, yeah, can you... Sorry, Ailey. Sorry, it was to suggest maybe if the member wants to forward the issues for inclusion in that letter, as yeah. suggested. Could you forward your issues to, to the clerk uh, or Leah on that? Yep, certainly. Thank you. And can I check then, is there any other members on the phone with anything in any other business before I move on to next meeting? No. So I'm moving on then to date, time and place of next meeting. Next meeting will take place at 10 a.m. on Thursday, 28th of May in the Senate Chamber. And I would remind members that this will be an all-day meeting. Thank you very much, members. Take care. Safe home. Agus Gormai Agus Gilair. Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber. Programme signed. This is the northern...